lessons and training them and, and teaching them how their activities can negatively impact on their livelihood um, is always a challenge but we spend a lot of time doing public education and awareness. Um, we've done projects in the past where we engage communities, for instance, to restore um, mangroves. With any country, you have priorities, and Trinidad and Tobago, we may have some priorities that may focus on economic development. And many times, not enough research goes into, um, and not, not enough funding going to research projects but there's a trust towards evidence-based decision-making. So we need to provide the data that the developers need, the data the policy makers need in order to foster the blue economy. Whether we go to the beach or not, marine spatial planning affects us all. It reduces pressures on the ocean, preserves and restores marine ecosystems, and safeguards ocean-related prosperity for generations to come. And with the IMA, marine spatial planning is leading us into the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development 2021 to 2030. Good afternoon. Welcome. This program is brought to you with the kind sponsorship of the Republic Bank Limited. Honorable ministers, members of the diplomatic corps, judicial officers, permanent secretaries, friends and stakeholders in the public and private sectors, academia and civil society, Professor Judith Gobin of the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies, and our esteemed panelists, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, good afternoon, and welcome to Below the Blue, exploring the Caribbean deep and harnessing its benefits, a program of the Institute of Marine Affairs. We are live on radio at 95.5. Welcome to all those joining us via radio. We are streaming on the IMA's Facebook and YouTube accounts, and of course, there are a number of you joining us via the Zoom webinar. My name is Alicia Carter Fisher. I am the Chief Information Officer at the Institute, and it's my pleasure to be here as your host and moderator this afternoon. I will guide you through what promises to be an exciting dialogue on what lies below the Caribbean deep sea, 200 meters from the surface of the water and beyond. When we started this journey two years ago, in anticipation of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, beginning in 2021, we envisioned an amplified national dialogue on our relationship with the waters around us, its value, and our impact on the sea's going, ongoing ability to serve us as they have for generations to come. The IMA has largely been focused on conservation of our blue assets, however, with the global thrust towards a blue economy, we looked deeper. And what was emerging was that opportunities abound for small island development states, developing states as us. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development around 2015 uh, gave a conservative estimate of, uh, the, of 24 trillion US dollars with regard to uh, emerging industries and the estimates of, of, you know, the kinds of business that can be done. So we thought perhaps it's time for us to revisit and uh, we might be able to relook at the future impact that our ocean and our ocean assets can have on our economy. Today, across the globe, it's World Oceans Day 2021. Ocean, life and livelihood. 
and we're quite on target as we explore the revenue earning potential of our depotions, though with its health at the center of all our action. We hope to accomplish a few things this afternoon, one of them being to sensitize you as to the fascinating deep sea world in our Caribbean waters. We want you to learn how what we have found at those depths can potentially transform our daily lives. We want you to know what opportunities there are for Caribbean economies to harness those new and emerging assets for the benefit of future generations. We also aim to find out what is required to actively participate in those new business ventures where the deep sea is the resource base. And I hasten to add, none of it should be done without conservation being our foremost concern. Before we take that leap into the unknown, the chairman of the Board of Governors of the IMA will bring greetings. Mr. Hayden Alexander is the chairman of the Board of, uh, at the Institute. He is in his second term as chairman, having been appointed, or I should say reappointed in October 2020. Along with the other appointees of the board, he has undertaken an, ambi an ambitious and visionary transformation of the organization with the aim of making the Institute a premier research organization in the Caribbean. An engineering and management professional with over 15 years experience in the field of chemical and process engineering, operations and project management, Mr. Alexander has considerable experience in the manufacturing and petrochemical sectors. He's also served in the public sector as an alderman of the Tunapuna Regional Corporation, or that should be the Tunapuna Piaku Regional Corporation. He currently lectures at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Alexander holds a degree in chemical and process engineering with honors from the University of the West Indies and a master of business administration with specialization in international finance with distinction from the Arthur Lockjack Global School of Business. We have a recording of his address, Mr. Alexander. We are standing by for the recording of Mr. Alexander's address. Good afternoon. I welcome all members of the diplomatic corps, judicial officers, permanent secretaries, our distinguished presenter, Professor Judith Gobin, and esteemed panelists, captains of industry, the academic and business communities, members of civil society, specially invited guests here and across the region, members of the media. Good afternoon. I welcome all of you on behalf of the Board of Governors, Management, and Staff of the Institute of Marine Affairs. 
when the government of Trinidad and Tobago and the United Nations began negotiations for the establishment of the IMA in 1976. It was with the express purpose of filling the void in knowledge around how marine resources contributed to our quality of life. The UN sought to relate applications of science and technology in the marine environment to the economic, social, political, and legal aspects of national life. By 1978, the IMA Act was passed in both houses of parliament and was promulgated. And there began decades of study on the marine and coastal areas. The results of this work formed the substance of advice to policymakers which has impacted our marine environment through legislative fixes, capacity development, and training for users of the marine space, and public education on the role the marine environment played in our lives. 40 plus years on, we have been re-examining our contribution to the national and regional development, especially in light of the government's stated purpose of placing the environment at the center of national development. The Institute asks itself some tough questions. Were we delivering value to our stakeholder and living up to some of our core functions? Was our work evolving to meet changing national and global expectations? Were we providing the answers our stakeholders needed to address some of the toughest issues facing us as a nation or region? Though the answers were yes in most instances, we found that given changing domestic and global financial circumstances, climate change impacts, and growing environment consciousness, we could do more. The IMA started off on a journey to truly have marine environmental issues be heard and counted at every level of national discourse and hopefully action. We knew that marine environmental science and the knowledge coming from our research could be used to solve some of our nations, and may I say the region's most burning issues. Our knowledge and perspectives, therefore, would not be left out of the national discourse as it relates to economic growth and the diversification of national revenue streams. As a twin island republic, the marine environment was already at the core of our being, whether we understood it to be so or not. Our plan was to have our research and initiatives arising from that study impact not only the environmental, but the socioeconomic fabric of our country. As a research organization, we know only too well the economic opportunities that lie in our coastal and marine spaces. Our research and advocacy must therefore support the development of ocean-based business, not only at the micro level, but also the macroeconomic level. The concept of a sustainable blue economy as an alternative economic framework was presented as early as 2012 in the global space. At its core was the idea of conserving the oceans while reaping their benefits in the most equitable and sustainable way. After all, oceans make this planet habitable, providing a range of ecosystem services food and livelihood opportunities. And while Trinidad and Tobago has fished our wealth out of the depths of the blue around it, the jury is still out on whether we have done so as sustainably as we should have. As you know, our petroleum-based economy has for well over a century lifted petroleum deposits found firstly on land and later in offshore shallow and deep horizons within an exclusive economic zone. Petroleum accounts for 40% of total exports, yet only 5% of employment. As a price taker, every shock on the global market redounds in a rapidly declining revenues with consequences for our quality of life across the board. Diversification of our economy has long been touted as the answer. And while there are other thriving activities, such as shipping and manufacturing, to name a few, Nothing has rivaled the revenue earning potential of the hydrocarbon sector. Our marine and coastal spaces have and would continue to be a major source of our wealth in the foreseeable future. Could our blue spaces aid in a decade-long quest for economic diversification and revenue stabilization? 
could the blue economy as it, and its principles provide us some answers? Our strategy for bringing our research and knowledge to impact on regional and national development lay in the five pillars of our strategic plan. But today, we are leveraging on just two of them. They are one, improved stakeholder value, and two, strengthening our external partnerships and engagement. It is hoped that our deliberations here today will allow us to provide decision makers a roadmap towards leveraging our blue assets in a manner that not only generates income, but allows for the renewal and conservation of the asset itself. We hope to point the way to exciting up new opportunities that provide answers to our long held quest for secure future revenues and food security. None of this would have been possible without our strategic partnerships. In this instance, with the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. Our collaboration governed by a memorandum of understanding brings us to the expertise of one of its most distinguished and accomplished daughters, Professor Judith Gobin. We are honored, Professor, to have you join us in the exploration of the new economic possibilities in our region. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, Republic Bank Limited, for their unwavering support. To our esteemed panelists, I extend my deepest gratitude. You have agreed to update us on the emerging trends in the high-value blue economy sector. Your participation and the loan of the wisdom that comes with the many years of research and analysis is truly appreciated. We salute you all. I am also delighted by the many stakeholders from academia, business, government, and civil society joining us for the dialogue. Welcome one and all. We anticipate a productive discussion and look forward to the key takeaways that will allow us to drive the process forward to influence and inform national and regional policy initiatives and collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for setting the context of our discourse this afternoon. Before we go on to hear from our distinguished lecturer and panel, none of this would have been possible without the support of our corporate partners, the Republic Bank Limited. This is the second year that they've partnered with us to bring you this event. Mr. Ray Klein, Group Head Investment Banking, will bring us greetings on behalf of the bank. In his role, Mr. Klein is responsible for mergers, acquisitions, and debt capital markets and structured finance. Previously, he was a vice president at Citigroup's private bank, where he structured alternative investment products for professional family offices. Before Citi, Ray worked at Morgan Stanley, where he ran a 13 billion alternative investment platform for high net worth clients to invest in property equity and real estate opportunities. Ray holds the Bachelor of Science in Finance and a Master of Business of administration from Columbia University of New York. We serves on the board of Literacy Incorporated, a nonprofit organization based in New York that promotes reading for children in low income communities throughout New York City. He's the current president of the Columbia Business School Alumni Club of the Caribbean. We turn now to the recording or the recorded statements of Mr. Ray Klein. And so we await the uh, broadcast, and here we are. Benefits. I thank you for. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. 
On behalf of Republic Bank, I thank you for joining us for today's event, hosted by the Institute of Marine Affairs under the heading Below the Blue, Exploring the Caribbean Deep and Harnessing Its Benefits. We applaud the IMA for its elevation of this discourse in the face of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Republic Bank is proud to be a program sponsor for this event, given its significance to the Caribbean. We believe that this event is both timely and also overdue at the risk of carrying conflicting messages. I say timely in the sense that many countries around the world are starting to take notice of the adverse effects of climate change on every aspect of their economies, especially industries highly vulnerable to these effects. Overdue in the sense that in the Caribbean, we have long experienced our fair share of the effects, but have been overlooked in the discourse by global policymakers. You see, our island states are not members of the G7 or G20, yet for us, these risks represent the most eminent threat to our economic livelihood. It is therefore against this backdrop that we welcome and support the spirit of this event, and we believe that it can serve as an important forum to advance the needs of our region. In 2020, Republic Bank became the first Caribbean bank to sign on to the United Nations Principles for Responsible Banking. In doing so, we joined over 200 peer banks around the world that made a commitment to align their lending practices to support the advancement of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. For the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, we identified three areas of importance. SDG 7, Affordable and Clean Energy, SDG 9, Industry Innovation and Infrastructure, and SDG 13, Climate Action. As part of our commitment to climate action and clean energy, we have set an ambitious US $200 million climate finance goal to finance infrastructure and renewable energy projects across the Caribbean. In relation to our commitment to promote industry, innovation, and infrastructure, we will aim to finance businesses and projects that promote responsible, sustainable, and resilient sectors of the economy. You see, in its purest definition, the blue economy represents several sustainable industries, including fishing, shipping, ports, dry docking, offshore oil and gas, renewable energy, and marine services. We firmly believe that Trinidad and Tobago can serve as an economic hub for the activities aligned or related to blue commerce in Latin America and Caribbean, given its position as a leading offshore gas producer, the strength of its financial systems, and its high human capital ratios. At present, we believe the Caribbean is at an inflection point given the events of the global pandemic on international travel. Nevertheless, we see this as an opportunity to pivot our national development strategies towards a more sustainable path. In order to do so, we believe that our leaders must take bold and decisive actions to ensure that our generations to come can benefit from the resources of our blue oceans and seas. I now would like to formally welcome our featured speaker, Professor Judith Gobin, from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and her esteemed panelists. We look forward to hearing from each of you on your areas of expertise. In closing, I leave with you the best of wishes for a productive and engaging event. Thank you and continue to be safe. Thank you, Mr. Klein. We are indeed grateful for the climate action stewardship and environmental proaction that the Republic Bank champions. Thirds, we thank you and we salute you. Just by way of a house announcement, some of our uh, Zoom webinar attendees have asked um, why they don't have access to their microphone. I would let you know at this point, when we get to the Q and A section, your microphones will be enabled for those of you who would put your hand up seeking to ask a question. It's my pleasure at this juncture to introduce our distinguished lecture, which is being delivered by our very own Professor Judith Gobin, Judith Gobin, a former IMA researcher. 
Professor Gobin is a professor of marine biology and an internationally recognized marine scientist with a career spanning more than 38 years. She has made significant contributions to the knowledge of marine biodiversity in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean with numerous publications and a number of new marine scientific records and new marine species, approximately 298. Her research began with her work in soft coastal marine sediments, followed by rocky shores, and more recently, deep sea areas. As a Caribbean marine scientist, Professor Gobin has achieved a number of firsts. Foremost is her appointment as the first female professor in life sciences in the history of the St. Augustine campus of uh, UWI. In 2018, she launched a book and a five-part DVD series called Deep Sea Wonders, featuring footage from an expedition by the exploration vessel E.V. Nauticalus. And she was the first Trinidad and Tobago marine scientist on board. That voyage was the first time Trinidad and Tobago's deep sea communities were revealed. Professor Gobin has been making marine scientific interventions and continue to contribute globally to the negotiations for the international legally binding instrument under the UN Convention for on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction commonly called BBNG. As a UE lecturer for the past 21 years, she is especially proud of the positive impact she continues to have on young scientists, both women and men. I welcome Professor Judith Gobin, whose lecture has been pre-recorded. After her presentation, we will go directly to our other panelists. We ask you to reserve your questions for, our, for Professor Gobin and indeed for the rest of the panel until all the presentations have been delivered. We are standing by at this time for the pre-recording of Professor Gobin's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today on a topic that is not only dear to me, but it is of great importance to our continued existence. That is the deep sea, the Caribbean deep sea. Island people's lives are inextricably linked to the sea. Ours is no different. Our twin island state of Trinidad and Tobago, like other small island developing states, has a vast amount of ocean resources at our disposal relative to our land space. At the same time, we have the most to lose from degradation, anthropogenic pollution, contamination, over extraction of all of our marine resources. But before we go any further, I invite you to come with me on a short journey deep into the blue of the northeast coast of Trinidad and Tobago. Up there. Octopus, yes. Oh yeah, look at him. Oh yeah, wow. another octopus. There we go. Go ahead and zoom if you want. Oh wow. He's beautiful. Gorgeous. Judy, Trinidad is delivering on the beautiful animals. Um, Trinidad <laughs> always does. <laughs> so welcome to paradise. <laughs> another moment brought to you by the 12 to 4, 12 to 4 Y. The bottom of the ocean is not an easy place to live. It is very cold, it is very dark, with extremely high pressures, reduced food, and it is also extremely difficult to locate a meat. Yet, this vast, dark, barely explored layer of the ocean is home to countless, weirdly wonderful creatures whose uniqueness have inspired movies. These animals are extremely well adapted to their environment. This glimpse, as we have just seen, of our very own deep sea is just a drop in the ocean, the tip of the iceberg. The first and exciting reveal which took place in 2014 
when the exploration vessel E.V. Nautilus came to the Caribbean. Thank you Ocean Exploration Trust, the OET and the E.V. Nautilus for facilitating this and for inviting for the first time two local scientists, Dr. Diva Amon, my colleague and myself. You may of course have already seen our five part DVD series, Deep Sea Wonders of the Caribbean, which was produced in collaboration with Nihost. As well, you would have seen our Deep Sea Wonders ebook, I hope. The deep ocean is defined as the sea and seabed below 200 meters, depth that is, and more. Life on the seafloor is a desert, devoid of life, and corals need light to grow. Or so our older textbooks say. Well, that has certainly changed. Deep sea research has uncovered a variety of treasures, including in the late 70s, when hydrothermal vents were discovered. These vents occur at the spreading centers between plates where cold seawater sinks, gets heated up to approximately 400 degrees centigrade and spews out minerals. At the same time, bacterial growth creates food from the hydrogen sulfide gases. Yet, for all such discoveries, there is much disparity in funding for deep ocean research compared to space research. In 2013, NASA's annual space exploration budget was roughly 3.8 billion, while NOAA's Office of Exploration and Research received only 23.7 million. Phenomenally, much more money continues to be spent on space research compared with deep sea research. This is quite odd really when it is clear that there are more resources associated with the deep sea. We now know that life on the seafloor is diverse and unusual and research and exploration cruises continue to reveal much of what was previously unknown to us. Again, thanks to the EV Nautilus, we discovered in 2014 two new methane seep sites of the northeast coast of Trinidad and Tobago. Methane hydrate is formed where there are sediments rich in organic carbon, which are microbially or thermally degraded, and the methane gas is then formed under extremely high pressure, and then with the very cold temperatures, causes stabilization and formation of the hydrate, or frozen methane. We also added richly to the Trinidad and Tobago's biodiversity during the 72 hour expedition. This is biodiversity unimagined. Diva and I have recorded more than 87 species, most of which are possibly new to science. They included polychaete worms, mussels, fish, crabs, sponges, octopus, etc. It is appropriate that this session today on World's Ocean Day reflects the theme of the United Nations Declaration for 2021 to 2030. The figures here are indeed startling. It shows us how very little we still know of the seafloor. It is the largest component of the Earth's system, yet the least unknown, least known rather, that stabilizes climate and supports life on Earth and human well-being. The United Nations has proclaimed a decade of ocean science for sustainable development 2021 to 2030, and I quote to support efforts to reverse the cycle of the decline in ocean health and to gather ocean stakeholders worldwide behind a common framework that will ensure ocean science can fully support countries in creating and improving conditions for sustainable development of the ocean. The UN declaration was also based on the first world ocean assessment, which was released in 2016 and I'm pleased to say that I was a co-author on the biodiversity chapter. The results of that assessment showed that much of the ocean is now seriously degraded with changes and losses in the structure, function and benefits from marine systems. The declaration was therefore, and I quote, an urgent call for action adopted by all United Nations countries 
to achieve 17 sustainable development goals which seek to end poverty and other deprivations while improving health and education, reducing inequality, spurring economic growth, tackling climate change and preserving our shared ocean and its resources. In keeping with the theme of this presentation and in order to identify resources that we can harness, that is to manage and make use of them, I wish to focus today on deep sea scientific research and its direct associated resources. In other words, a good and thorough understanding of the ecosystems and the resources and their functioning is what is needed. This is ideally the first step before we venture into harnessing of a particular deep sea resource. But deep sea research is quite expensive for us. We need to have ship time, access to a research vessel. At the moment, opportunities are few for our scientists. We have managed with ships of opportunities, but we need autonomous vehicles, we need ROVs or remotely operated ones, deep submergence vehicles fitted with high definition cameras. These are all needed for visual recordings. We need high tech acoustic and sampling devices, multi beam echo sounding, acoustic underwater positioning systems for deep water mapping. All of these are required to simply provide specific details of the deep ocean. Yet, we are already aware of the various ecological functions and ecosystems within the deep sea. These functional benefits need to be understood before we begin to consider harnessing these resources. These include provisioning services such as sources of fish, shellfish, biodiversity as we've mentioned, energy, minerals, genetic resources from which we get pharmaceuticals. The deep sea sediments are coming, becoming increasingly an important source of food, energy resources and minerals, all in support of the growing world population and its technology. The varied habitats on the margins provide key substrate, nursery grounds and refuge for animals. The deep sea is a major contributor to carbon cycling and therefore climate regulation. The pictorial shows the regulating function of the oceans and the deep sea. Carbon dioxide is cycled through what we call the biological pump. It is then sent to the seafloor where it becomes buried or sequestered. This pump transports carbon from the atmosphere into the deep ocean water masses, reducing the impact of anthropogenic carbon release. Microbial oxidation of methane keeps another potent greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere while trapping carbon. Nutrient regeneration by the fauna that live here creates the elements necessary for fueling surface productivity and fisheries. Microbial processes also detoxify a diversity of compounds. These are all key processes to the global functioning of the ocean. In our quest, therefore, to harness from the deep seas, we must ensure that we do not inhibit or lose these services that it already provides. Conservation and sustainability of our ocean resources is therefore key. Trinidad and Tobago has a long history of marine exploration, starting around 1954, and that has continued with great success with oil and gas as the major drivers of our economy. As the largest oil and natural gas producer in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago's hydrocarbon sector moved from an oil dominant to a mostly natural gas based sector in the early 1990s. Exploration of the deep waters began more recently, in 2016, with BHP Billiton's deep water gas find. Like the rest of the world, it is expected though that we will be moving away from fossil fuels and towards looking towards renewable energy sources. The International Energy Agency only last week released its report 
titled Net Zero by 2050, a roadmap for the global energy sector. The report states, and I quote, Beyond projects already committed as of 2021, there are no new oil and gas fields approved for development in our pathway and no new coal mines or mine extensions are required. The unwavering policy focus on climate change in the net zero pathway results in a sharp decline in fossil fuel demand, meaning that the focus for oil and gas producers switches entirely to output and emissions reductions from the operation of existing assets. The overall negative impacts on the oceans of oil and gas exploration activities is well known and the shift away to renewable sources of energy is extremely welcome. Deep sea mining for minerals like cobalt cross polymetallic sulphides and polymetallic nodules, although valuable materials in all of our modern day for modern day electronics, similarly produce extremely negative impacts on the deep ocean communities. Let us not destroy deep ocean communities before we even discover them. With the push to engage and develop our blue economy and its various activities, I therefore urge caution in our interpretation. This is not about the ocean and especially the deep sea, which is our last frontier, it's not simply that it is open for business. Yet, some opportunities do exist for the deep ocean. Biodiscovery is non-destructive and entails the collecting of biological resources to identify valuable molecular or genetic resources, or MGRs. These are then used in a laboratory setting where genetic and molecular or biotechnology techniques are applied to develop new bioproducts. These include food products, cosmetics, industrial chemicals, enzymes, and pharmaceuticals. Bio-inspired optical materials may also be fabricated from naturally derived cellulose nanocrystals, and these tend to possess unique combinations of strength and toughness. Often it is the ideas or data generated from these products that are used and not necessarily the original products. The following table shows the potential value of marine genetic resources that have originated in SIDS territories, that's small island developing states, including, you will note, the Caribbean. This is a billion dollar industry. Yondelis is an anti-cancer agent derived from a tunicate from the Caribbean. Adcetris is also an anti-cancer agent derived from a mollusk from Mauritius. Estee Lauder's anti-aging creams are derived from a Caribbean Gorgonian or sea whip. And there are other potential opportunities such as wave energy is perhaps the largest untapped source of clean energy as we move away from traditional fossil fuels. Some islands like Aruba and Curaçao are developing wave energy to meet their island's goals of 50% renewable generation. Deep sea fishery is not extensive in our territory, according to our fisheries division, and must be carefully managed. These are slow growing, long lived species which are more susceptible to overfishing. The COVID pandemic has seen governments urging nationals to engage in local tourism. While Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic plans to fly passengers into space, Ocean Gate Expedition plans to have deep sea trips to the Titanic. Perhaps we could encourage Caribbean submarine tri trips to wreck sites and or other interesting archaeological sites. Why we wish to create benefits for our citizens, including greater economic stability, improved health care and better education, we need to ensure that we allow the deep sea resources to remain in a stage such that they continue or it continues to generate the resources for generations to come. This is what sustainability is all about. 
scientific research and the associated knowledge are key to ensuring conservation of biodiversity and sustainable use of our deep sea resources. Scientists have agreed that there is much connect connectivity between ocean systems. Human activities on land impact our deep sea ecosystems. One of the principal challenges for protecting deep sea biodiversity is an appreciation of what actually exists there in the first place. That is, we need to have a knowledge of the baseline communities that exist in order to measure changes and further to predict impacts and changes associated with that. While we may never be able to acquire comprehensive information at an ocean scale due to its vastness, we can use these data to design conservation programs and including marine protected areas and protecting vulnerable marine ecosystems or VMES, such as our own very methane seeps. Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean has very specific needs to achieve this. We must improve on our marine and technical and scientific capacity. We must develop and secure financing and funding mechanisms to carry out deep sea research. This could include scholarships, training, workshops, exchanging, research visits for scientists. Biodiversity and taxonomic expertise needs to be supported, while marine biotechnology, genomics research, labs and equipment all need to be able, all need to be upgraded to enable us to derive value from marine biodiversity research. Clusters are needed or research clusters to achieve impact. We need to partner with industry, government, research institutions. The private sector must be engaged. Educational and institutional capacity must be strengthened. We must promote and expand training and, training and career opportunities for scientific research. At the same time, we need to develop science and technical IT expertise. We need to be creative and innovative in our development of capacity building solutions for Trinidad and Tobago. Apart from my earlier suggestions in the previous slide, the following are some very specific recommendations for funding, which is of course very critical and of course in the support of our science. A scientific permitting system for research vessels coming into our waters and of course, there can be conditions. For example, this can be secured and or waived if local scientists are included. Ensuring through additional legislation, existing policies and legislation, that exploration vessels coming into our waters engage with scientists and scientific institu institutions. In this respect, our existing Certificate of Environmental Clearance rules the legislative framework under our environmental management does not outright mandate that where a CEC is being granted, the applicant must partner with academic institutions either to conduct monitoring or to ascertain the state of the, the, state of the surrounding environment. It does, however, provide scope for mandating such a partnership. Section 36.1 of the EM Act and Rule 7.1 of the CEC rules allows the Environmental Management Authority to include such terms and conditions in a CEC as it sees fit and in synergy with the proposed scientific project. At the same time, our national environmental policy is replete with commitments that the state will support research and academic institutions in undertaking systematic assessments. The EM Act provides that the EMA and all governmental entities shall conduct their operations and programs in accordance with the NEP or National Environmental Policy. The mandatory nature of this provision has been affirmed by the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in the case of Fisherman and Friends of the Sea versus the Minister of Planning, Housing and the Environment 2017. UKPC 37, in which it was held that the NEP was indeed binding on the Minister with responsibility for the environment in the execution of statutory powers 
under the EM Act. My humble recommendation, therefore, is that scientific and research support and partnerships be included either as 1. a condition of the CEC or under the NEP itself, there is a good foundation for amending the EM Act and the CEC rules to clearly provide for such synergies and or partnership, research support be included as a term in petroleum licenses which could provide funding for deep ocean research and training and development scholarships. But before we begin to go deep into our oceans in the area of biodiscovery, we need to recognize that many of these potential MGRs may be located outside of our EEZ and in areas beyond our national jurisdictions. At this time, myself and colleagues on the panel are actively engaged in providing background information to our UN representatives on a new legally binding instrument on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, BBNJ. This is of significance in that SIDS territories, including Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean, do not have specific laws dealing with access and benefit sharing of marine genetic resources. That is, no potential benefits and no regulations of bioprospecting activities. The BBNJ agreement is for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction under UNCLOS. I am very pleased to say that we are promoting scientific research into marine biodiversity and enabling equitable sharing of benefits from the utilization of MGRs. These are key focal areas which we, DOZI, CARICOM and other SIDS are bringing to the negotiations. Transitioning to a blue economy in the Caribbean requires policies that treat the ocean as a unique development space shaped by the ecology, i.e. the ecosystem-based development approach and that includes marine spatial planning and ocean zoning. At the same time, stewardship of the ocean is key. Deep ocean stewardship is key to balancing the use of our resources. We need to maintain the integrity of our deep ocean ecosystems for future generations. The DOSI group is a global organization and I'm pleased to say I am a member of the advisory board. DOSI is a multidiscipline network of over 2,000 individuals from 98 countries. The group is actively working to inform national, regional and global deep sea policy through independent science. We integrate science, technology, policy, law and economics to advise on ecosystem-based management and resource use in the deep ocean and strategies to maintain the integrity of deep ocean ecosystems within national jurisdiction. Deep ocean stewardship is indeed necessary. We are custodians of the last frontier. Ladies and gentlemen and colleagues all, our resources on land are shrinking or reducing and or they are severely impacted and becoming less productive. The oceans, and more specifically, the deep sea, is the last frontier of opportunity. Today's session with our expert panel provides us with a timely and much needed opportunity to look closely at how we treat with and how we continue to sustainably use and manage our deep oceans. Let us turn the tide on the ocean. Let us agree to continue to improve on the acquisition of scientific knowledge to build up our capacity, human and financial, to ensure there is adequate transfer of marine te technologies through partnerships and alliances. Against this backdrop, we can then be guided to harness those deep sea resources which may be able, which we may be able to use sustainably and to manage sustainably. The world is watching Trinidad and Tobago. We must continue to be pioneers 
of good ocean governance. Let us respond to the call of the decade of ocean science for sustainable development towards a cleaner, healthier, deep blue Caribbean. Today, I took you on a dive into the deep blue, which is perhaps the weirdest place on earth. I hope that you are now more appreciative of this place of wonder and life. A place that holds tremendous mystery that even movies are made of. The continuation of which is squarely on our shoulders. Our, your and my, our choices are what will make the difference between a future of either loss or sustainability. I make this special plea to us in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean on this World Oceans Day 2021. And as we highlight the decade of oceans, let us move towards transformative thinking and engage in integrated and collaborative actions towards conservation of our own deep sea. I thank you sincerely and I thank the Institute of Marine Affairs for this privilege. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. You've given us much to digest. You have outlined not only what the possibilities are for economic exploration, but put forward the necessary caution so that we do not overexploit our resources before we understand what's there and the role they play in preserving life on Earth as we know it. Uh, you also spoke to measures and strategies to ensure local scientists benefit from any work being done in our waters by international teams. And you've also called for perhaps a reimagining and of our CEC and EM Act to include scientific research uh, and account for the work being done by our scientists. Thank you very much, Professor. Before one embarks on any venture, business or otherwise, it is recommended that one counts the cost. Today's panelists will help us do just that. What must be the legal, financial, or other considerations a country must be, must be cognizant of when contemplating participation in an emerging industry, such as marine genetic resources, bioprospecting. Here to provide some insight into what internal legal treaties and instruments are being considered to govern marine genetic prospecting, particularly as it relates to areas beyond national jurisdiction is our next presenter, Mr. Khalil. Hassan Ali. Mr. Hassan Ali will speak to you on the ongoing UN negotiation for treaties to manage the utilization of blue assets in areas of the ocean beyond national jurisdictional borders. And he may share with you some of the Caribbean community's negotiation position. Mr. Hassan Ali is a researcher, is a researcher in marine policy and governance at the IMA, and is currently pursuing studies leading to a PhD in marine affairs at the World Maritime University Global Ocean Institute. His PhD research is examining the interrelationship between a legally binding instrument being negotiated on the, Uni the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea on the convention and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction or the BBNJ, the blue economy of the Caribbean and the blue economy of the Caribbean community. I might have said he also uh, acts as a negotiator on behalf of CARICOM with regard to UN negotiations on the BBNJ uh, agreement. He has a strong interest in the, creation of, and in the creation and implementation of policy focused on conservation and the sustainable use of ocean and coastal resources 
especially within national and regional contexts. As our tech team begins to bring up his pre-recorded video, his pre-recorded presentation, I will leave with you that Mr. Hassan Ali holds the MSc in Environment and Development from the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. And in 2013, 2014, uh, he was the United Nations Nippon Foundation of Japan Fellow where he received advanced education in ocean affairs and the law of the sea. We now go over to the pre-recorded presentation of Khalil Hassanali. Hello everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to join you here, all here virtually this afternoon. Uh, first, let me start by thanking the IMA for inviting me to participate on this panel. Uh, in my brief presentation today, I'll be giving some insight into an international agreement currently being negotiated at the United Nations, which deals with conserving and managing biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, and why, from a, a blue economy perspective, we as Caribbean countries and Caribbean people should be interested. Now, so many of the, of the world's unique and biodiverse deep water environments that have been showcased and discussed by, by Professor Gobin can be found in areas within national jurisdiction. But I think it's, it's fair to say that it's more common to find them in areas beyond national jurisdiction or ABNG. On the map, ABNG is represented in dark blue. And you can see that about two thirds of, of all ocean space and 45% of the area of the planet are areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, it, it is the location of some of the most unique, sensitive and unexplored biological ecosystems, such as deep sea hydrothermal vents and sea moths. Now, beyond national jurisdiction, a patchwork of international bodies and treaties manage ocean resources and human activity. Many of these bodies are sectoral in nature with few mechanisms existing to facilitate communication and coordination between them. Uh, and in addition to this, these bodies vary greatly in, in terms of their mandate and focus with biodiversity conservation very often not being their, their main priority. Now this, this piecemeal governance approach has led to the degradation of areas and resources in, in areas beyond national jurisdiction and makes deploying management and conservation tools challenging both legally and logistically. Now, recognizing that the current regime for preservation and conservation of biodiversity found in areas beyond national jurisdiction is not ideal, uh, the nations of the world have embarked on a process aimed at making improvements. And that process is, is really the crafting of the, of the BBNJ agreement. The BBNJ agreement will be an implementing agreement under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, and it will deal with the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, the letters highlighted in red on the slide uh, denoting how the BBNG acronym was derived. We are currently in the intergovernmental conference stage of negotiations trying to elaborate the text of the agreement. And uh, CARICOM countries have been very active negotiating in this agreement and, and we as CARICOM countries negotiate as a bloc. So the scope of the, of the BBNG negotiations was agreed back in 2011. Uh, the 2011 package deal earmarked uh, four things in particular and, and taken as a whole uh, to be negotiated. They are one, marine genetic resources, or MGRs, including questions on the sharing of benefits. Two, measures such as area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, or MPAs. Three, environmental impact assessment. And four, capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. Um, so these are the four topics under negotiation in the BBNJ agreement. Now, although most CARICOM countries lack the resources and capacity to actually go out into areas beyond national jurisdiction to conduct exploitative activities, we have to remember that the marine, that marine areas are, are fluid, dynamic, and interconnected. 
Therefore, what happens in marine areas beyond national jurisdiction can have great bearing on the spaces, activities, and resources that we make use of within our own national jurisdiction in the process of blue economy development. So considering marine genetic resources, or MGRs, in the BBNG negotiations at the moment, uh, at the moment, only a few countries and private entities have the financial resources and technical know-how to effectively conduct MGR research in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, CARICOM is, is pushing to have the benefits arising out of MGR research be shared instead of just, of it just accumulating to the few who possess the ability to carry out collection and research on MGRs from areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, it's really envisaged that the benefits to be shared should be both monetary and non-monetary. Non-monetary benefits may include, for example, allowing developing countries to actually participate on research cruises being carried out, um, having information and results of scientific research on MGRs be freely shared, and allowing researchers from the developing world facilitated open access to genetic material and information gathered from ABNG. Uh, on the other hand, monetary benefits can entail the sharing of proceeds resulting from commercialization of products which have been developed using MGRs collected from ABNG. And the sharing of these benefits, both monetary and non-monetary, could help us in the Caribbean further develop our capacity to carry out MGR research, uh, for example, for use in developing pharmaceutical uh, products. And this could yet prove to be a, a viable emerging blue economy sector in the Caribbean. Considering area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, um, the intention is, is to create a, a coordinated procedure for proposing, implementing, and managing MPAs and other area-based management tools in ABNG. Uh, perhaps a local example of the leatherback turtle, which nests on many beaches around Trinidad and Tobago, uh, if I use this example, it would best illustrate why CARICOM countries would be interested in this aspect of the agreement from a blue economy perspective. These turtles nest on our beaches, but they spend a significant portion of their life migrating through waters in ABNG. And we will want to ensure that these wonderful creatures that are, are the basis for local community-based uh, ecotourism are protected as best as they can be, not only in our waters, but also in international waters. Now, with respect to environmental impact assessment, um, although it's unlikely that CARICOM countries would be proposing projects in ABNG in the near future, we know that because ocean currents provide means to transport pollutants and other potentially harmful substances, from ABNG into our coastal waters, we have to be very concerned about what activities are permitted to occur and really ensure that robust EIAs are conducted. Uh, think of sargassum. Although sargassum is a natural occurrence, it is an example of something that originates in international waters and travels through ocean circulation, uh, eventually inundating our, our coastlines and severely affecting some blue economy sectors such as tourism and fishing. Um, the same mechanisms that transport sargassum can also transport pollutants from activities occurring in ABNG. And we therefore have to, be, have to ensure that high quality EIAs are conducted for activities that will be proposed in areas beyond national jurisdiction and that rigorous evaluations of these EIAs occur before these proposed activities are given permission to proceed. And lastly, capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. Um, this, this capacity building and the transfer of marine technology is of huge importance and focus for CARICOM. Uh, capacity building and techno transfer is greatly needed to fulfill ob obligations and also exercise our rights arising um, that would arise out of the BBNJ agreement. Now, given that the, the BBNJ agreement, given what the BBNJ agreement entails, capacity building and tra technology transfer would involve many things, or could involve many things, including assistance in building our indigenous cap capabilities regarding tools, techniques, and expertise to conduct scientific research on MGRs, um, capacity building and conceptualizing, implementing, and managing marine protected areas, 
and other area-based management tools, and capacity building in, in conducting and evaluating EIAs. Now, these forms of capacity building would not only uh, be applicable, apl applicable within, would, would be applicable within our areas of national jurisdiction, as well as in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, CARICOM is, is really pushing to have mandatory capacity building and technology transfer for developing countries as part of the agreement, and also pushing to have the provision of guaranteed accessible long-term funding to have this approved. So uh, that's just a quick overview of the BBNG agreement and, and some of what CARICOM is interested in from a, a blue economy perspective. Formal negotiations have, have been on hold for the past year and a half because of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, but there's a strong desire to resume as soon as possible um, for what it is hoped will be the final negotiating session. Um, August 2021 is being bandied about as the as a date for the resumption, but of course it's all contingent on, on getting yeah, on mute. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you all for listening. Um, I would just like to, to close by thanking the IMA once again for inviting me to be part of this discussion. And I'd also like to acknowledge the general support of the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management and the German Federal Agency of uh, German Federal Ministry of Transport and Digital Infrastructure, who are the sponsors of, of my PhD program. Um, I look forward to your further engagement and, and questions a little later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalil Hassanali. Seeds resulting from commercializing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalil Hassanali, uh, for bringing us up to date on what is happening with regard to the UN no negotiations. You've given us an understanding of where considerations are going for the exploration of marine genetic resources uh, that are found beyond national jurisdiction at a global level. We now turn to country level considerations. And Dr. Diva Amon tells us what countries considering bioprospecting for marine genetic resources should firstly put in place to protect our deep ocean. And as our tech team uh, gets her, pre her pre recorded presentation ready, I'll tell you a little bit of what she speaks about. She advises on what regulations and policy considerations should be enacted in order to protect the deep sea marine environment and their sensitive ecosystems. Dr. Amon is a marine biologist focused on the little known habitats and animals of the deep ocean and how our actions are impacting them. She works at the Nexus of Science, Policy and Communications and has a deep desire to see stewardship measures applied to the deep ocean, as well as to the engagement of a broader group of global stakeholders in this effort. In 2013, she completed her PhD at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom, after which she spent three years at the University of Hawaii, USA, researching the abyssal corner of the Clarion Clipton Zone, of Clarion Clipton Zone. Diva then undertook a Marie Curie Research Fellowship at the Natural History Museum in London. She has been participating, or she has participated in research cruises around the world, exploring uh, unknown deep sea habitats from Antarctica to the Mar Mariana Trench. She has recently spoken at the United Nations and the Nobel Prize. She has filmed with National, National Geographic, BBC, and CNN, to name just a few. Dr. Amon is a founder and director of Species, a local NGO dedicated to marine science education and advocacy in Trinidad and Tobago. And she is a former IMA researcher. We now take you to her pre-recorded presentation. I give you 
Dr. Siva Amon. Good afternoon and huge thanks to the IMA for inviting me to participate in this event. It is always a real honor to talk about the deep ocean, but especially when it pertains to Trinidad and Tobago. So my name is Dr. Diva Amon. I'm a marine biologist focused on the little known habitats and animals of the deep ocean and how our actions are impacting them. And I work at a ne the nexus of science, policy and communication, and I have a deep desire to see stewardship measures applied to the deep ocean, as well as a much broader group of global stakeholders being engaged towards that effort. And I'm also one of the founders and directors of Species, a local NGO dedicated to marine science, marine education, and marine advocacy. And not many people realize that Trinidad and Tobago is actually mostly deep ocean. In fact, about 65% of our area is deep sea, and that's everything from that red line eastwards. And it is our largest ecosystem by far, but very little of it has ever been explored. The only area that has been explored by remotely operated vehicle or submersible for research purposes is where that pink star is. But that tiny area that's been explored, you know, has really revealed some truly incredible deep sea habitats and species. We have methane seeps that um, with beds of mussels and tree worms and shrimp and crabs and much more that stretch as far as the eye can see in the deep ocean. And we also have coral and sponge gardens and many, many new species. And this really begs the question about how much more there is to discover within our waters. And, you know, not only is the deep ocean here in Trinidad and Tobago our largest ecosystem and our least explored ecosystem, but it's incredibly important to us and all of life. It has huge unknown biodiversity, as we've heard already, you know, and those are living resources that are linked to fisheries that so many of us rely on, that could provide marine genetic resources that could be useful in pharmaceuticals and biotechnology in the future. And there are also non-living resources. Of course, we all know there is oil and gas, which we are already exploring. But the deep sea also regulates our climate by sequestering carbon and absorbing heat. It cycles nutrients and chemicals, and it absorbs waste. And it is culturally relevant too. Although that's something that we often underestimate. It you know, really inspires us. It's just such an enigmatic place. It has real educational value. It has real aesthetic value. And often we you know, gain something from knowing, just knowing that the deep ocean exists, but also that we are good stewards of it. Case in point, this event today, how many people are listening right now to hear about the deep sea? And you know, this increase in deep ocean technology and um, exploration and research has really allowed us to learn much more about the global deep ocean and how animals down there live and survive. And one of the most common traits is that most life in the deep ocean is slow. And so because most of the food in the deep sea drifts down from the surface layers in the form of marine snow. So for instance, we know in the surface layers, there are lots, there's lots of life, plankton and of course fish and turtles and whales and dolphins and all the things that we are used to. But those often die, of course, and then they drift down into the deep sea. And that's where most of the food comes from. But that means that there's not a lot to go around. And so animals tend to conserve their energy. They have slow metabolism, they move slowly, they grow slowly, they take a long time to become mature, they reproduce slowly. And some animals get to very, very old ages. In fact, some of the oldest animals in the world are found in the deep sea. So we know that the Greenland shark can live for over 400 years and become sexually mature at about 150 years old. And we know that tube worms, which we have in our waters, can live for over a thousand years. We know that corals, gold corals, and black corals can live for over 3,000, sorry, nearly 3,000 and over 4,000 years old, respectively. And we know that there are glass sponges that have been found to be over 11,000 years old. And that's, of course, nearly as twice as old as the wheel. And I just want you to stop for a second and think about one animal being alive for that length of time, like how much has happened in human history. And so that really means that life in the deep ocean operates on a very, very different time scale to what you and I are used to. Um, and these long time scales means that deep sea life is fragile and it doesn't cope well with impact or change. And that means that recovery is not likely to occur within our lifetime 
or our children's lifetimes or our grandchildren's lifetimes. You know, once we break it, we will not be likely to fix it. And it will be unlikely that it is fixed in human timescales or potentially ever. And this is, of course, concerning because now more than ever, we have increasing exploitation and damage combined with a lack of stewardship. And so our deep ocean, even in Trinidad and Tobago, is changing quickly. So what can we do about it here? So the first thing we need to do is put in place policies to facilitate deep ocean science. We need scientific information to know what lives there and not just what lives there, but how it responds to change and what that means for management. But understanding the ocean doesn't always lead to good practice or to the ocean that we want. And that's because we often don't consider people as well. So instead, we need to better understand the needs and priorities of ocean dependent people and evaluate potential solutions for them. You know, how are people connected to the ocean and what is the value of sensitive deep sea environments to them in Trinidad and Tobago? And not only economic value, this is the crucial point, not just economic value, but also ecological value and cultural value. So really this needs to be a holistic approach that includes not just science, but people. And then if we're considering any activities, we need to adopt a precautionary approach until we have a better understanding of what exists in the deep sea, as well as robust policies to effectively manage and protect that biodiversity and that function we must proceed using this precautionary approach and apply that across the board to all decision making. And that means placing an emphasis on the use of the mitigation hierarchy. And so you can see that here. And what that means is we really are only able to use in the deep ocean the top two levels, avoid and minimize, because restore and offset are just not possible in the deep sea. So that means we should be avoiding and minimizing resource mismanagement, degradation, and depletion until we can really begin to make informed decisions about that management. But we may not be able to wait for all of that science to be done. So we should be employing stewardship instruments regardless. We should be doing that now. And this includes area-based management tools, spatial management plans that include the establishment of a network of marine protected areas. These MPAs should be large, fully protected from the sea floor right up to the sea surface and climate smart. We know those things work when put into place in a marine protected area. And we also know that at least 30% of our exclusive economic zone being protected by 2030 is a pretty good goal. And that's a goal that we think many countries around the world are going to adopt in the CBD negotiations, which are coming up. And you know, there's really strong evidence from marine protected areas around the world that when a marine protected area is fully protected or highly protected, it preserves fish populations, it protects fragile and valuable ecosystems, and it increases ecosystem resilience, but also it delivers benefits to communities, some of which can be economic through, for instance, increased tourism revenue, revenue or from, um, more resilience to extreme storm events, et cetera, et cetera, and also even greater fishery catches from adjacent unprotected areas. And then there are also smaller mechanisms that can be put in place. So for instance, related to our oil and gas extraction, the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management in the USA requires an exclusion zone for oil and gas activities around high density biological communities, such as deep sea coral gardens and methane seeps. And we know here in Trinidad and Tobago, we have both of those habitats, and yet we do not have any similar policies. We should be putting in place something like this. Also, you know, there should be a robust framework to assess environmental impacts and utilize comprehensive and rigorous global standards, transparent monitoring, and where necessary, really reimagining existing processes to combat cumulative impacts, which are happening more and more in the deep sea. And to help with all this, we really need a robust institutional framework that allows the implementation of these safeguards. For instance, through an open and transparent scientific committee that has influence over decision making. We need a scientific body here in Trinidad to help with ocean management. And finally, you know, we need to remember that the ocean is, of course, global. Trinidad and Tobago's waters are connected to 
Guyana, Venezuela, Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, and the international waters. And so that 200, that 200 nautical mile line that marks our EEZ really means, of course, little to marine life and all of the services that we rely on. So we need to be pushing for holistic transboundary measures. And to do that, we need to be participating in regional discussions and really leading those discussions from a conservation perspective. And we also need to be participating in global processes, such as pushing for a robust biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction treaty at the United Nations, and also those discussions occurring at the International Seabed Authority. Because even if we did the best job of stewarding our waters, it would mean very little if the rest of the ocean failed. So to close, you know, today is World Oceans Day, and I feel like on every single World Oceans Day, we have these kinds of conversations. And so I want you to stop for a second and think about where we want Trinidad and Tobago's ocean stewardship to be by next year's World Oceans Day. Or let's be more ambitious than that. Not even next year, the World Oceans Day. Let's think about World Oceans Day 10 years from now. We're at the start of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development, and we really need to sit and think about what are the kinds of conversations and actions we want to happen in that time. And that's because here in Trinidad and Tobago, our ocean is our lifeline, and we urgently need to think about the specifics of our ocean ecosystems, of our deep ocean ecosystems, and really step up our robust stewardship for them, but not just for them, for us too. So many thanks for listening today. Um, I'm really looking forward to the panel and taking all of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Amon. Fascinating insights. Uh, you advise on that precautionary approach before we start exploiting our deep sea resources. You reminded that protected marine environments add benefits to human communities as it does to our marine organisms. And of course, you call for some scientific body that contributes to ocean management at the decision-making level. And you've given us, uh, you've uh, painted a nice platform for us to start considering market opportunities uh, in marine genetic resources and how we might finance such beginning of a review of market opportunities will be Professor Marcel Jaspers of the University of Aberdeen in the United Kingdom. Professor Jaspers uh, will speak on the topic, the opportunities and challenges for the exploration of marine genetic resources by small island development states with measures to overcome those challenges. And as our tech team gets his pre-recorded uh, video uh, presentation ready. I will tell you a little bit about his expertise. Uh, his main expertise is in the discovery, characterization, and utilization of the useful products and processes from marine genetic resources. This forms the core of the marine biodiscovery pipeline, and Professor Jaspers has frequent contact with people operating at all stages of this pipeline, from the collection and identification of the organisms to the testing of potential pharmaceuticals in whole animal models. Professor Jaspers founded the Interdisciplinary Marine Biodiscovery Center at the University of Aberdeen in 2010, a 2.5 million pound investment to focus on marine bioresources for novel pharmaceuticals. Professor Jaspers is also the co-founder of a spin-out economy that, uh, I should say, company that uses marine enzymes to generate complex, modified, physical peptides to address complex diseases. He has been active at the national and international levels uh, to develop science, its applications, its, its industrial uptake and associated policy involved in marine biodiscovery and biotechnology. Since 2014, Professor Jaspers has been involved in the UN process on the conservation and sustainability of biodiversity 
in areas beyond national jurisdiction, providing scientific input and co-authoring a proposal which provides the building blocks based on good scientific practice towards a solution. He took on the role of Vice President International for the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 2019. We are indeed delighted to take you now to the presentation, the pre-recorded presentation of Professor Marcel Jaspers. Hi there, my name is Marcel Jaspers and I work at the Marine Biodiscovery Center at the University of Aberdeen in the UK. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the opportunities and challenges for the exploitation of marine genetic resources by small island developing states with measures to overcome those challenges. First of all, I would like to present to you the opportunity. There are some examples from the Caribbean that have been successfully developed to either drug molecules or cosmetics. The example here is the Caribbean sea squirt called Echinocidia turbinata that was discovered in the 1980s by a group at Illinois and a group in Florida to contain interesting compounds with anti-cancer potential. This was then developed by the Spanish drug company Pharmamar, who um, took it all the way to the clinic. The process took over 20 years to do, to do this, and they don't produce the material by harvesting the original sea squirt. What they do instead is they use a fermentation product that's then modified using chemistry to make the final product. Another example is this face cream component derived from a Caribbean sea whip called Tsuloterogogia elizabethae. This contains a very potent anti-inflammatory that's included in high-end face creams. The compound itself is produced by environmentally managing um, farming of these sea whips and then extracting the components that are needed for the, um, the face cream. Again, this is a very small market but a very high-end uh, face cream. So how does the process of marine biodiscovery take place? First of all, we typically have a process of sample co collection and curation, uh, which means that we take the sample from the seafloor typically and then uh, collect it uh, into a, a vessel and that's then labeled with the correct um, species if we can identify it, followed by um, storage in a collection, uh, either industrial collection or academic collection. For the next stage of the process, which is chemical extraction of the substances of interest, followed by purification of the components. This is followed by biological testing to find out whether or not the molecule has, for instance, activity against inflammation, infection, uh, cancer, and other diseases. And that process is repeated several times until a pure compound is derived. So again, it goes around from testing to purification, testing, purification, till we find a pure compound. That compound is then structurally characterized using sophisticated chemical techniques. Uh, at which stage, uh, if it is of interest, preclinical development can be carried out using, um, for instance, cell-based and animal trials, uh, followed by then if the decision is made to take it forward by, uh, by, by, by human trials. That means then at that point, if the decision is taken to take it all the way to the clinic, um, the success rates can be very low and the process can take a very long time. If you're fortunate, you can get all the way to the marketing process if you get marketing approval. And that again can take a whole, um, take a long time. This whole process for the example of Yondelis on the previous slide took over 20 years. It was discovered in the 1980s and approved in 2010. So what we can see, for instance, is that we would often describe the first part as basic research and the last part as commercial research and development. However, industry does sometimes do this whole process, although it's rare for large pharmaceutical companies to do so. It's often done by small to medium-sized enterprises, which are spin-outs of universities, for instance. Uh, but most likely, it's basic research up to this point carried out in research institutions and universities, followed by commercial R&D uh, at some point when a compound is identified of interest and has been tested to, to a certain extent. The cost for this process um, can be quite extensive, but you can really carry out the first three steps of that process for a relatively low cost. That is, tens of thousands of US dollars will be needed to set up a laboratory to do so. Um, if you wanted to go to the next stage, of having the chemical equipment to identify the structures of the compounds that you found, which makes them patentable, uh, you would spend upwards of a hundred thousands of dollars. Finally, the final stage can be done by no single entity. It's quite often carried out by a number of agencies, including industry. Um, and that means it can cost up to millions of dollars, uh, particularly for the, the full development of a drug molecule. So under normal circumstances, 
uh, small countries can carry out the, the first three phases of the process quite easily using, as I said, a, a range of equipment that is available at a relatively low cost. And often additional, for instance, biological testing information can be obtained from international through international partnerships and the identification needing that equipment can often be carried out internationally through partnerships as well, uh, followed by development and trials which need commercial input quite often uh, and marketing and sales does as well. So really the influence of universities is typically the first four steps of this process and as I said the international partnerships can come into play for the middle two of those uh, particular things between academic institutions. I'd like to present to you now the idea of using inclusive innovation to address these challenges that, that are faced. But quite often, by using, um, but by, by looking at the local needs that are um, identified, what we can look at as local issues that can be addressed with local resources by using local talent. And I like this idea very much, where we can have this idea of having, for instance, a, a disease that's endemic to a particular part of the world, and are using local resources like local marine genetic resources and then using local talent uh, to identify components that can address those local issues and again making it more uh, the ownership of that project will then be with um, the local scientists. The, the, the needs of uh, SIDS are indeed unique in terms of, of for instance um, how to do that research and who to do it with and who to partner with internationally um, and again, those partnerships need to be long-term. They can't just be for a few weeks or a few months. They certainly need to be developed over a period of years, and that's in incredibly important to make sure that the research is carried out in an inclusive way, looking at the needs of both uh, partners involved in the process. And at any stage, that work needs to be carried out with fairness, respect, care, and honesty. So finally, to say here that those partnerships um, need to understand each other's needs whilst working towards a common goal. Again, common goals need to respect um, those issues of fairness, respect, care and honesty. We need to integrate aspects from different subjects to solve those challenges, so not just science but also social aspects of the project and also policy aspects. Uh, we need to make sure that everybody's engaged in the process, anybody from primary school children to policy makers. So finally, I would like to say that this development of long-term mutually beneficial relationships is essential. Um, what I've done over my career is to, is to mentor a number of, of, of my ex-PhD students around the world to ensure that they have the research facilities that they need in order to carry out the work. What I've learned from my um, students as well is how the work ca is carried out in their country, what their local needs are, what their local um, facilities are like, and help them build up those facilities over a long time period. And again, that's been incredibly beneficial for both me and for my mentees. Uh, and they again are mentoring me to understand their local conditions and um, their uh, particular environment. And again, what is needed to solve problems there are, is a complementarity of experience and expertise, and I think this is really important to build on those uh, particular relationships. The way ahead, I think, would be uh, to establish facilities to en enable that first part of the biodiscovery pipeline to be established. In a biodiversity-rich country like Trinidad and Tobago, I would recommend a collection of materials, making sure you have a curated collection of, of materials and extracts you can then start to investigate using uh, basic equipment in the laboratories. What needs to happen to engage with those international partners is to have more training opportunities either in country or out of country, to have staff and student exchanges to allow um, them to access facilities that they might not otherwise get and learn how to set up those facilities in their own laboratories, arrange those mentorship arrangements over a long period of time and engage with industries from local SMEs to the global corporations that enable them to understand the benefits that might be accrued by addressing marine genetic resources. Over time, you'll be able to build facilities that will enable achievement of the whole process to, look, to use local resources to address local challenges with local talent. Finally, our Marine Biodiscovery Center can certainly support some of these measures, building on a good working relationship already with the University of the West Indies. Finally, what are the benefits of all of this besides potential uh, monetary benefits? It allows you to build capacity to collect and sustainably use those marine genetic resources and promotes scientific research and facilitates understanding of those marine genetic resources, which enables you to improve the conservation of those resources, which essentially is the most important outcome really of any of this, to make sure that our marine genetic resources are conserved for future generations. It will generate not only uh, products, but also knowledge and technological innovation and give you the fac facilitate the development and conduct of marine scientific research. Again, not just products at the out outset, 
but also the process as a whole of scientific discovery is important. It will enhance your scientific reputation and create talented young researchers that can set up companies and be beneficial to the country as a whole. And they can create local industry to address local needs. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor Jaspers, for identifying the process used to separate potentially useful compounds and what is required for bringing our research to market in the form of new products. Through it all, long-term collaboration you identified is key. Training and offering uh, opportunities for young scientists to practice their craft, own their craft, and that intersection between research and industry is critical. And from what I hear you uh, to be saying, Professor, is that none of this is gonna happen overnight, but we, through all that you have mentioned, we are putting the building blocks for future success. Uh, Professor Jaspers also highlighted how capital intensive some of these uh, breakthroughs in the markets uh, will likely to be. And so it brings us nicely to our next presenter, Mr. Torsten Thiele, uh, who will speak on innovative finance for ecosystem conservation, restoration, and sustainable economic development. He is a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. He focuses on ocean governance, marine conservation, and sustainable finance, uh, drawing on 20 years of experience in project and infrastructure financing at leading financial institutions. He's the founder of the Global Ocean Trust and a, the senior research associate at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, POSTAM and he's the senior advisor to the IUCN Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility. As our tech team gets the presentation, the pre-recorded presentation of Mr. Torsten Thiele ready, uh, I will just add that he advises governments and other bodies on policy, biodiversity, and innovative blue finance. Recent, his recent publications addressed Blue infrastructure and nation, and sorry, nature based solution, innovative high seas funding mechanisms, blue bonds, deep sea governance, and ocean and climate bio, and climate bio, climate and biodiversity linkages. I take you now to the pre recorded presentation of Mr. Torsten Thiele. Hello, my name is Torsten Thiele and I'm delighted to join you today for this important World Ocean Day panel. The title of my talk is Engaging Science and Business to Explore the Deep, Innovative Finance for Ecosystem Conservation, Restoration and Sustainable Economic Development. So let's unpack this rather complicated title. What I'm going to talk about is five main themes. One is that the sustainable blue economy provides a significant opportunity. However, marine biodiversity finance faces a dilemma. So how can we overcome this gap in financing? Well, I suggest we can apply an ocean perspective where we look at ocean risk and capacity development and opportunities and jointly develop a cooperative approach to the deep ocean which then gives us ways to develop financing strategies so let's start by talking about the sustainable blue economy now this is a narrative that is well established now we started in uh, the European Union with the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Principles. The United Nations Environmental Programme has a Sustainable Blue Economy Initiative. And the Ocean Panel recently suggested a transformative set of recommendations to advance a sustainable ocean economy to sustainably manage 100% of the ocean. Now in the Caribbean, we've got a Jeff Blue Economy Project and CARICOM is looking at blue economy approaches. So what is the purpose of this 
key focus. Here is a slide a chart from a recent article we published, which shows that the traditional ocean economy based on extraction is slowly shrinking, but the sustainable blue economy based on renewables, on zero carbon, zero waste, and focusing on ecosystem restoration, blue well-being is growing and becoming a more important part of the overall sustainable economy. Now, what this picture shows is that for an island in particular, integrating nature-based solutions into its coastal infrastructure is a key component of developing these solutions. This um, includes co-design management areas where activities and nature coexist and work together, where coral reefs continue to play their um, natural role in both creating significant biodiversity, but also reducing wave energy, helping to be nurseries. And all this integrated way of nature helps the island infrastructure. Now, as we heard, financing of this is challenging, even though we know that the benefits of protecting natural capital far exceed the cost. And therefore, we need to scale the sustainable blue economy financings in an integrated way using innovative pathways. And I think one of these pathways is to tell the story of the deep ocean so that we can show how the deep ocean is linked and critical to this new holistic approach of dealing with climate challenges, biodiversity risks, and the need for development and the benefits for society. So the International Oceanographic Commission has talked about capacity development that integrates ocean research and observation into delivery of early warning systems, assessment for policies, and then the sustainable management and governance. A economic way of looking at the deep ocean is to talk about the valuation of its natural capital. And this is increasingly possible. We have now global efforts around ocean accounting and we look at all the various ecosystem services of the deep, of the stocks of protection and the flows of benefits, whether it's from the cycling of nutrients, the impact on food chain and on carbon, but also the habitats, the cultural services. And we have a whole range of new economic valuation methods. And this is directly applicable to business. So applying the draft natural capital protocol for the ocean helps businesses to make the right decision based on this economic approach. But beyond economics, we are talking real financial flows. Nature-based solutions are key in how we spend the 94 trillion US dollars that are forecast as global infrastructure spent over the next two decades. So we will, the world will be spending this money, but the roads that we build, the wastewater infrastructures, all of these structures and the coastal real estate all depend significantly how we interact with nature, how we effectively integrate local communities, how we build in a way that we can lower risks and improve the overall economics of these projects. And that means that we need to really think of deep ocean funding for science and monitoring as an investment, as something that not only can pay for itself, but that delivers crucial information to a whole multiple range of users. And we can make this more cost effective by integrating into international efforts, by applying modern technologies on sensors on the one hand, data on the other, and by working across a whole sea basin and global scale. And on the financing side, that means innovation around how we blend 
grant funding, commercial investment, how we integrate public spending, how we integrate, use new mechanisms. And we could even consider a new ocean sustainability bank. Already, multilateral development banks are a key partner in this process. And in this uh, recent book that we wrote with uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature for the Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility, we're showing this how this approach can work around nature-based solutions in the coastal resilience space. And what I'm arguing here is we can take this thinking even further. We can take this into the deep ocean. So the key messages really are new blended finance solutions can help de-risk blue investments and attract a broader range of investors. This requires robust metrics and monitoring of the deep. And delivering this sort of finance also needs an enabling environment. So that's the integration of the government strategy with the private sector action and the science and business-based support. And concepts such as blue carbon and blue natural capital, ocean accounting, all help to identify investment opportunities and an emerging asset class, a way to invest in the long term in nature. And it provides us with a way to engage with private sectors, with the local communities and civil societies, so that we can deliver revenues and support resilience. But this type of just and equitable transition in the form of a new Blue Deal requires a broad-based participation. So I thank you all for your interest and look forward to further discussions. Thank you for sharing, Mr. Thieland. A mix of financing solutions to manage risk. Uh, you spoke about rigorous monitoring and evaluation, collaboration across sectors uh, were some of the suggestions you gave us. As our tech team uh, queues up our next presentation, uh, well, which is going to be live from uh, Dr. Amanda Netburn uh, from the United States of America, I would just say to you that our radio audience we have about maybe 10 or so more minutes uh, via radio, and I'm inviting our radio audience to join us uh, via our social media platforms, uh, YouTube and Facebook. You can continue the discourse with us. You can send your questions via those platforms and engage with us, continue the discussions via our social media platforms. And uh, coming up next uh, would be Dr. Amanda Nadburn. Um, and because uh, one of the things uh, Mr. Thieland uh, spoke to was collaboration across sectors and the fact that that is critical for ventures of this magnitude, quite a few of our presenters have in fact pointed to collaboration. Professor Jaspers did that as well. I now turn to the institution that's had a, that has had a number of years successfully bringing government, science and technology, and the private sector to deliver breakthrough results in a number of areas related to ocean matters. I speak of none other than the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Admos Administration, NOAA. Dr. Amanda Nadburn represents NOAA today, and she's an oceanographer uh, in the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. She's, however, currently on assignment uh, to the United States White House as co-chair of the Ocean Science and Technology Subcommittee, and she also sits as executive director of the National Ocean Mapping, Exploration, and Characterization Council, NOMEC. She will speak on mobilizing for success. She will speak to how government, private sector partnerships are needed for deep sea exploration and asset monetization. She's currently uh, on detail at the, the White House, as I would have mentioned. And, um, and I'm inviting her now to open her microphone, uh, share her screen, and uh, the mic is over to you. Dr. Netburn. Great. 
Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. It, it really is an honor to be uh, included on this really esteemed panel. I've been enjoying all of the talks so far and learning a lot, and I'm excited to share with you how NOAA and how the US government work with the private sector and other partners to accomplish our work on ocean exploration. I'm going to start this talk with a high level overview of ocean mapping and exploration activities in the US. And then I'll highlight some of the partnerships that NOAA has in place and has recently initiated to implement these goals. By leading national efforts to explore our ocean and making ocean exploration more accessible. NOAA Ocean Exploration is filling gaps in our basic understanding of US deep waters and the seafloor, providing critical deep ocean data, information, and awareness needed to sustain, excuse me, and accelerate the economy, health, and security of our nation. Why do we do this? Well, I think many of our speakers that we've already heard from today have, have very well covered why we explore. But in short, ocean mapping and exploration data have a range of applications from conducting basic science to managing fisheries, protecting national security, making siting decisions for offshore infrastructure, monitoring ecosystem impacts of extractive activities, and informing where to locate marine protected areas amongst other uses. But of course, NOAA doesn't work in isolation. Cross-agency partnerships allow us to expand our goals and our capacity to meet whole of government data needs in the deep ocean. In 2020, the US initiated the National Ocean Mapping, Exploration, and Characterization Strategy. In short, this is also known as the NOMAC strategy. The high-level goals of this strategy are to coordinate interagency efforts and resources to map, explore, and characterize the US CEZ. Um, to map the US exclusive economic zone over the next couple of decades, to explore and to characterize priority areas of the US CEZ. And we have a distinction between exploration and, and characterization and that exploration is kind of that, that first pass look in unknown parts of the ocean, an initial assessment of an area's physical, chemical and biological characteristics. While ocean characterization provides more in depth data and interpretations for a specific area in direct support of specific research, resource management, policy making, or applied mission objectives. The next goal to develop and mature new emerging science and technologies in order to accomplish these uh, ambitious goals to map, map the US and um, explore it. And finally, and most relevant to the conversation today is to build public and private partnerships in order to meet these goals. Because we know that government alone will not be successful without the expertise, the technology, and the assets that are available in the private sector. These activities further feed into several international activities, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today, but they include Seabed 2030, which has a goal of mapping the global ocean by 2030, and the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, we've heard about earlier today, um, has a vision to conduct the science we need for the ocean we want all across the globe. So, you know, I think my talk today could be summarized in that you know, really when done right, ocean exploration is always a partnership. It always involves lots of different entities. And as one way to highlight this, I, sh I show you this example of NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. It's a dedicated vessel for ocean exploration in the United States. Mission planning and overall coordination is handled by NOAA Ocean Exploration. The ship is operated by another part of NOAA, the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. The remotely operated vehicle is operated by a nonprofit entity called the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. It's supported through a long-term NOAA cooperative agreement. The ship also often supports technology demonstration projects. These are usually one-off opportunities where academic, industry, sometimes other government partners come out to test new and emerging technologies to understand their operational potential. 
Scientists with all sorts of different affiliations participate in the expeditions through the use of telepresence capabilities, live streaming, ROV footage, um, and being able to communicate in real time with the ship. Finally, all the data that are collected are made publicly available, where they could be used by any number of interests, free of charge, sometimes without our really knowing it, <clears throat> in what we might call a more informal partnership. A couple of years back in, in November 2019, the White House hosted an Ocean Science and Technology Partnership Summit. It brought together leaders in government, academia, private industry, and philanthropy. The key takeaways of this summit were, first, the US is poised to lead a new era of bold innovation in ocean science and technology. Second, partnerships across all the different sectors are essential to advancing ocean science and technology. And finally, a collaborative and dynamic strategy for partnerships in ocean science and technology will coordinate, focus, and catalyze a national effort. The National Ocean Mapping, Exploration, and Characterization Strategy that I mentioned earlier was one of the direct outcomes of the input from this summit. And it identifies cross-sectoral participation as absolutely critical to the success of this uh, partnership. And it's something that the interagency group that's tackling this is now very focused on building out those partnerships. While well, NOAA has had partnerships throughout the course of its existence, I wanted to walk today through some of the recently initiated partnerships, which fall under three themes. The first is ocean exploration and mapping, the second, education and capacity building, and the third is data sharing. So in ocean exploration and mapping, NOAA has agreements in place with several different groups, OceanX, Caladan, Schmidt Ocean Institute, and Vulcan that operate exploration-focused vessels with deep submergence assets. The agreements are in place for activities like data and information sharing, access to expertise, to vessels, to technologies, the possibility for joint expeditions and exchange of personnel, and promotion of each other's activities. There are a number of other more kind of traditional partnerships that are in place. And these include things like contracts for hydrographic services. So uh, some of the mapping that uh, NOAA is responsible for gets uh, conducted by contractors. Um, we also have grantees across all sorts of different sectors working on technology development and exploration. Finally, personnel is kind of an overlooked partnership that we don't talk a lot about, but in, in government, we work with a lot of contracting companies to provide personnel to support on major activities that are happening in the federal space. On education and capacity building, there's a partnership in place with the Ocean Foundation. This is focused on international and other activities with focus areas on marine special and protected areas, biodiversity, climate change impacts, science and, te and technology, and more. There's also a partnership with the Guy Harvey Foundation focused on educational opportunities. One of the most recent partnerships that NOAA has undertaken is with Orsted Wind Power. The partnership, the agreement that's in place is to share physical and biological data in Orsted leased water subject to US jurisdiction. The agreement is the first of its kind between an offshore wind developer and NOAA, and it paves the way for similar data sharing agreements with other developers as the US expands its wind power generation capacity. So before I close and we move on to our next speaker, I'll just share that NOAA Ocean Exploration is, is celebrating its 20th year. We're all excited to be celebrating that. And its, it's success really was only accomplished through the power of partnerships. We anticipate that more and different partnerships over the next 20 years and more working across the government and with private sector, international and other partners to map and explore our great oceans and address the most critical data needs needed to effectively manage and sustain the ocean. Thank you and, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Nedburn, uh, for that insight as to how NOAA exactly puts together its our uh, portfolio of networking between government, industry, technology, how you build capacity of staff, share knowledge, share data, 
Thank you very much for those insights. We now go to uh, Dr. Alan Leonardi, who will kind of round up that discourse on collaboration. Dr. Leonardi is the president and CEO of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which represents the leading ocean science, research, and technology organizations from academia, industry, and larger nonprofit sector, including philanthropy, associations, and aquariums uh, from around the United States. He spent most of his career, in fact, working at NOAA, uh, where he was most recently the director of the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. In that role, he oversaw and supported expeditionary exploration activities, which combined traditional at sea exploration and science technologies uh, with emerging technologies uh, such as the autonomous maritime systems, high speed networks, and infrastructure for live communications, including high definition video of the seafloor to scientists and other audiences ashore. At NOAA, he also served as the acting director and deputy director of the Office of Policy Planning and Evaluation. He was manager for the Environmental Modeling Program and deputy director for the Atlantic Ocean Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Leonardi has an advanced ocean exploration research and technology through service on several councils and advisory board, boards, including NOMEC and the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative Advisory Board. Um, and the Transatlantic Assessment and Deep Water Ecosystem Based Spatial Management Plan for Europe. Uh, he's been involved in that as well. Uh, without further ado, as the tech team cues his pre recorded presentation, I would let you know that Dr. Leonardi received his master's and doctorate degrees in physical oceanography from Florida State University and his undergraduate degree in meteorology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I take you now to the pre-recorded presentation of Dr. Alan Leonardi. Hello, my name is Alan Leonardi and I'm the president and CEO at the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about collaboration, which we believe is a key to sustainably advancing ocean science, development, and conservation. When we think of collaboration, we think of three key ingredients. Convening people and groups together around common goals, conveying information with a unified voice to all groups and decision makers in need, and cultivating relationships as well as the next generation of scientists and engineers. Over the next few slides, I'm going to talk about some examples of where we have done these independently, as well as where we have done them together for various activities. One of our primary focus on the convening role is for our efforts with the Consensus of Marine Life. In 2000, from 2000 to 2010, the Census of Marine Life was a project that collected data on biodiversity, distribution, and abundance of ocean life. Over 670 institutions across time zones and disciplines participated, and 540 expeditions took place involving 2,700 scientists that made more than 6.4 million direct observations of marine species and published over 2,600 academic papers on their work. The census described 1,200 new species with 5,000 additional potential new species collected but not yet described. The Consortium for Ocean Leadership was the international secretariat for this effort and led the overall charge. The census accomplished more through its international effort than could be done by individual efforts. So this is an example where we brought the group, the community together around a common but large project and topic. And today, as the community has shown interest in and the need for another census type project, the Consortium of Ocean Leadership has reconvened the international community for a virtual symposium called the Observing Life in a Changing Ocean to highlight the need and generate excitement for a sustained, collaborative, and systematic program in marine biodiversity research and observation. When we think about conveying, one of the marquee examples that we have is our role with the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative Synthesis. For the last 10 years, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership has managed the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, 
a 10-year effort following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill focused on improving society's ability to understand, respond to, and mitigate the impacts of petroleum pollution and related stressors on the marine and coastal ecosystems, particularly those in the Gulf of Mexico. As part of these efforts, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership has coordinated a scientific synthesis to capture and collate 10 years of research into new understanding and improved practices. The synthesis effort included 20 unique thematic workshops and 10 conference special sessions. It collected input from nearly 600 different experts and produced more than 50 new products, from journal articles and book books to webinars and white papers that ultimately are intended to convey this information in a unified way to a variety of target audiences. When we think about cultivation and especially building the next generation of ocean scientists, our marquee programmatic area is with the National Ocean Sciences Bowl. It is a quiz bowl competition for high schoolers around the country and the United States. There are currently about 25 regional competitions that take place each year, with the winners of those regional competitions going on to the Nationals final. The National Ocean Sciences Bowl fills a gap in the high school curricula, where most high schools currently don't include ocean science in their curricula. The National Ocean Sciences Bowl provides students with an opportunity to learn about the ocean, but also about possible career opportunities that might be related to their life after high school. The Consortium of Ocean Leadership has ultimately cultivated the relationships with not just the students, but also the volunteers, the coaches, the regional coordinators, the mentors, the scientists, and the sponsors, and more over time. Ultimately, our goal is to continue introducing students to ocean science opportunities as a career option and creating a more ocean literate society. And the National Ocean Sciences Bowl educates thousands of students each year. In 2020 alone, we educated 1,390 students that made up 278 different teams from 31 out of the 50 United States. And of course, we couldn't have done any of this without the help of thousands of volunteers. So these are examples of where we have convened, conveyed, and cultivated uh, in our role and collaboration independently. But for the next two slides, I want to talk a little bit about what we've done to convene, convey, and cultivate around a theme or an idea with the community. And I'm going to start with the Ocean OBS 19 uh, conference that the Consortium for Ocean Leadership organized the scientific program for. This was a conference that took place in Honolulu. It was the third in a series of international decadal conferences focused on convening members of the ocean observing community from scientists to end users in order to both define and reach shared goals. The meeting brought together 1,200 attendees from 60 countries and included 53 delegates representing indigenous peoples from around the world. Sectors involved included the government at the multinational, national, state, local levels, academia, industry, philanthropy, nonprofits, grassroots, and citizen science outfits, as well as the media and more. Primary conference outcomes led to uh, an overall conference statement, uh, a declaration about ind indigenous peoples, and a living action plan ultimately that takes the momentum of Ocean Ops 19 to build communities of practice around the shared goals as defined by consensus at the conference. Before COVID-19, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership team was organizing and hosting follow-on events such as town halls at the American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting and the Ocean Sciences Meeting to convey the community priorities determined at the conference as well as the steps being taken to realize those goals to a wider audience. These meetings were also an opportunity for Ocean Ops 19 participants to show their progress on these goals with other members of the Ocean Ops community and find opportunities for collaboration. One of the great things to come out of Ocean Ops 19 were the communities of practice who were identified and self-organized in response to the scientific or societal gaps that were determined. One such group, the Observing Air-Sea Interactions Strategy Group, is a community working to harmonize observational strategies and develop a practical, integrated approach to observing air-sea interactions through capacity development, leveraging of multidisciplinary activities, and advancement of understanding. They are now an official SCORE working group. Another example where we did all of these three things together was in one of our annual policy forums, this one taking place in 2017, focused on food security. At that forum, Senator Roger Wickard from Mississippi talked about aquaculture and asked the community if there was the need for legislation to advance offshore fin fish aquaculture. The workshop and the, and the forum, all participants agreed that there was indeed a need, so Senator Wicker had his staff begin working on legislation. Later, in 2018, he and Senator Marco Rubio from Florida first introduced the legislation, the Advancing the Quality and Understanding of American Aquaculture Act. Also in 2018, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, in partnership with the Meridian Institute, hosted an industry forum on U.S. offshore aquaculture called Will We Fish or Cut Bait? 
The ultimate goal of this forum was exploring, with diverse stakeholders, whether or not the United States should pursue offshore fin fish aquaculture and what science is needed to ensure a science-based, sustainable, economically viable industry. The Consortium of Ocean Leadership continued to communicate and cultivate relationships with policymakers, conveying the information from both of these forums. And in 2020, Senator Wicker, Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii, and Senator Rubio reintroduced a much modified bipartisan bill in the Congress that incorporated the feedback from the community and from these forums. The bill also has House counterpart support within the U.S. Congress. These are examples of how we have convened independently, conveyed independently, and cultivated independently, as well as convened, conveyed, and cultivated together on major science and societal issues. And in summary, I really want to focus on that collaboration is about these three key ingredients, and that as you've seen in these slides, they can be singularly powerful in isolation, but when taken together, they are truly much more exponentially powerful in combination. I look forward to the conversation and the panel and any questions that you may have and appreciate you listening to me on this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leonardi. Thank you for sharing and demonstrating how global and regional collaboration can aid in technology transfer, capacity building, and broadening the depth of research conducted by individual groups. Together, we definitely can achieve more. Thank you to all our panelists. At this time, I want to remind you that you're listening to a broadcast from the Institute of Marine Affairs sponsored by the Republic Bank Limited. You've heard a lot, there's lots to digest. And as we prepare to go into the question and answer, answer section, uh, we just take a word from our, our host, the IMA and Republic Bank Limited. We go right into the question and answer segment. Uh, I remind you that uh, you can raise your hand to voice some of your questions, and, or you can simply type your question in the question and answer feature and have one of the panelists uh, answer your question. Um, if you desire to let your voice be heard, just simply raise your hand and uh, the tech team will open your microphone. Uh, we've heard a lot, um, so I invite our panelists at this time to open their own microphones, uh, open their, their videos, and give us about a 60 second or less roundup of what their main points were in their presentations as we move in to the question and answer segment. If you are interested in asking a question, again, raise your hand and our tech team will uh, enable you to uh, unmute yourself so that you can ask that question. So I will take uh, Professor Gobin first. Uh, just give up, a, a, give us a little synopsis. You know, as we move into the question and answer section segment of our of our session here today, um, provide us the fodder for that robust discussion. <laughs> Sure. Thank you very much, Alicia. And um, just to get straight into it, basically, um, if I had to give, you know, what my key sort of take home message would be, um, the theme for Revolution Day is about its life and livelihoods. That's the theme for 2021. And the discussions that we've had today, and I especially reminded us about the need for science. I think um, we have recognized, and I think it was really good that it was all through the threads of most of the talks, all of the talks, that without science, humanity is at risk. And the need for, we have therefore the need for good science and good, in this particular case, we're talking deep sea research. Um, and my, I made a special appeal for um, partnerships and for a, a huge thrust, really, a request for financial and other support 
um, helping us as marine scientists to build knowledge and to build capacity. Um, this is the only way we can work towards making informed decisions. And finally, I'm making a plea um, to that we have greater collaboration in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean with our decision makers. We have a lot of evidence. We're getting more evidence. And as we continue to improve on the science, we certainly can work with our decision makers towards a cleaner and a healthier ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I'll take uh, Hassan Ali, uh, 60 seconds or less. Thanks, Ms. Carter Fisher. Um, quick wrap up. Um, I guess my, my main takeaway point would be that the, the BBNG agreement really has the potential to, to influence the Caribbean blue economy in, in a number of ways, um, many of them being hugely positive if, if we can manage to get the, the certain things uh, negotiated into the agreement. Um, CARICOM is, is being has been very active and, and very influential in the negotiations thus far. Um, and I think apart from, from actually um, trying to, to have the BBNJ agreement positively influence our domestic blue economy, um, CARICOM also sees the, the importance of, of being global stewards for, for uh, the global commons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Jaspers. Synopsis, 60 seconds or less. Hey, yeah. Um, I want to really talk about the benefits of biodiscovery and what they are. And my feeling is that the most important outcomes of these things are developing uh, long-term international partnerships, which give you a lot of uh, scientific knowledge, which can be used for conservation of marine biodiversity, but also ends in having a very good trained workforce that is useful uh, for many, many different benefits. Uh, one of them is that it will often lead to economic development, uh, for instance, by the foundation of small companies uh, that address local needs. That would be my take-home message. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Leonardi, that thread of collaboration, collaboration is going throughout all of the presentations and your organization, Consortium for Ocean Leadership, you, your charge, your main charge is collaboration. Give us your roundup in 60 seconds or less. Sure, I think, I think you helped me out there, Alicia. I mean, the, the bottom line is that we've seen a lot of presentations today that talk about the implications of the science, the need for sustainable development, the need to think about lives and livelihoods. Uh, we can't do that unless we bring all communities together, stakeholders, users, practitioners, and, the, and, and, the, and the, the citizenry to really understand the needs and the challenges. And once we do that, we can really pave a path forward that might be beneficial for all. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ned Byrne, NO has had a long history of cultivating those partnerships. 60 seconds or less. Thank you. Yeah, I think my, my take home message is, is no one can go it alone, right? No individual, no sector. So, you know, coming from a government perspective, although we have, you know, missions that are, are set by whether it's by Congress or the executive branch that we don't, we, we can't do it alone. We need to rely on the expertise, on um, assets, on, you know, all, all of the other sectors to be able to, um, you know, achieve big things. So, um, you know, co collaboration, again, as, as others are saying, is really key to being successful in this space. Thank you so much. And I remind you once again, if you'd like to ask a question, you simply raise your hand and, and uh, our tech team would unmute you. There during the presentation, there were a robust discussion between our panelists and some questions that came forward. And I would want to uh, read some of those. But before we go into questions, nothing can happen without money. Money, 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 money. Uh, Mr. Torsten Thielen. Thank you very much indeed. And this is a great discussion to have. And the interesting thing with finance is it's a tool. It can be applied to the space. And it's all about understanding the value of natural capital that then allows investment into that space and to bring finance into it. So the combination of the right approach from a scientific point of view, from a governance point of view allows finance to flow into the sector. And so I'm very confident that the sustainable blue economy
framing will help to bring financing for the right types of projects in this area. Thank you so much. I'm going to take a question uh, from our deputy director uh, with responsibility for research. He basically thanked our, present, our presenters for their wealth of information. And he asked with respect to marine genetic resources, can anyone indicate in the development sorry, of this Alicia, resource? I think you forgot Diva. Oh, I'm sorry, Diva. How can I forget you? I that is okay. Save the best for last. <laughs> Um, just to quickly say, and you know, I was grateful for the time to begin to put thoughts together, but just echoing a lot of what's already been said, you know, the deep ocean is our largest ecosystem in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's poorly explored and it's ever changing and changing faster than ever. And so really, in order to be able to properly protect, we need to be able to know what's there and are able to uh, effectively manage it, we need to be able to understand it. And in order to su su sustainably steward it, we need to value it. And so really all of that needs to be guided by appropriate environmental policies. And just like you just heard from Torsten, finance is a tool, it's the same with policy. And that policy needs to be based in robust science as we keep hearing again and again today. And that science needs to be directed at not just answering um, questions related to the environment, but also thinking about how it affects ocean dependent people. And then I guess the, the other main take home is that the deep sea is a really fragile place and we need to exercise precaution moving forward. If we break it, we can't fix it. And so when thinking about Trinidad and Tobago's blue economy, we need to be pushing for one that is not only sustainable, but also potentially even restorative. And a key part of that will have marine spatial planning, area-based management tools, a robust environmental impact assessment process, and of course, fundamentally, the political will to push all of that forward. Thanks. All of that, thank you so much. So it's political will, uh, technology transfer, building mentees, uh, collaboration, 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 being innovative in our uh, use of financing tools, putting the regulatory, uh, the, the necessary re regulatory tools in place so that we don't destroy what we don't know about. And the third question, I will go to uh, Mr. Torsten Thiele. Um, we have uh, Ms. Janice Germain and she's asking, um, and she's throwing it out there to the other panelists as well. She's saying the Seychelles has been successful in engaging in debt for native swaps to protect 30% of the EEZ. What is the potential for Trinidad and Tobago to follow this similar model to protect our deep seas and marine resources in general? I'll uh, ask Torsten and then Diva, you may, perhaps you may want to jump in there as well. Um, that's an excellent example, the, the Seychelles, because what the Seychelles example shows is that you can bring in financing tools if you also bring in this commitment to more protection. So the Seychelles were willing to protect further marine areas, and in, uh, in exchange as part of the structure, they uh, were able to structure a debt for nature swap and a blue bond, so a new financing instrument. And I think the third part of that answers also another question I saw in the text, which is really about how do you get local businesses involved? What are the funding for it? And what the Seychelles did is they put this new money into something called SACAT, a conservation trust. And that conservation trust provides both specific grants in certain areas for protection, but it also provides through the development bank of the Seychelles, loans to fishermen who want to retrain or other types of activities that want to switch towards this sustainability. So it's an excellent example. It's a perfectly viable approach that uh, is being looked at in the, the Caribbean. And uh, yes, I would only encourage people to look further at how best to apply these lessons to Trinidad and Tobago as well. Eva, you have any comments, any contributions? No? Let me take this question from Dr. Daryl Bandrew. Uh, and he's basically saying, with respect to marine genetic resources, can anyone indicate uh, in the development of this resource how countries can benefit such that the wealth of natural resources are shared amongst its peoples? Is there a model on how wealth generation can support the blue economy in a way that's beneficial for the whole region? Uh, if I may, throwing somewhat a, a bit of a, what I think he might also be asking. You know, a lot of times we have our 
blue economies and big business benefits, but coastal communities, which are sometimes the most vulnerable, do not necessarily benefit, necessarily benefit from the activity in the blue economy. I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting it right, Dr. Banju. Any comments, any uh, clarifications, anything that you'd want to add to what he's asking? Any insights? I see that we have two hands raised and I would ask our tech team to open the mic so that those two persons can ask their questions. Well, my tech team is advising that we have two hands raised. Uh, so you can go yeah. ahead if I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Alicia. This is uh, Cesar Toro uh, from uh, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate Trinidad Tobago for having this dialogue, this discussion, this consultation. This is the key issue. We need to have the, 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 this kind of consultation in order to be prepared. We can't manage anything we don't know. And in order to do that, we need to have a disciplined way to, 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 to do that. And this is one of the first steps and major steps when we have the different actors and stakeholders having the conversation. So thank, uh, I would like to, to congratulate, especially today, the uh, World Ocean Day. So uh, it was highlighted very much uh, through the, the presentations and uh, uh, for the strategy uh, about the partnerships, about the need for science, etc. And this is precisely what is the, at the core of the United Nations uh, decade for ocean science and sustainable development. Yeah, that we, uh, all of you, you have been pointing out to that precise framework. It's extremely important. And we know that uh, ocean science, and in particular, for what we are willing to understand and uh, uh, develop in your theme is the deep, the deep sea. This is one of the areas that is, uh, as you, you all the speakers show, is that is one of the most expensive way, expensive areas, and even the the, the uh, where we have m less knowledge about that. So that would require those partnerships, and we have already. The good news is that you 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 have already a, a series of instruments, even legal in UNCLOS, for instance. You have the possibility of organizing yourself and organizing and developing ocean science research and exploration within a, a cooperation agreement that is a, 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 you, you can use the framework of, the, of UNCLOS and use the, the framework of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission for cooperating. And the, a, one, of the, one of the speakers show, especially uh, when we are talking about the development, the need for respecting the rules and be respectful of the local national uh, interests, etc., and not to come up directly and dictate what I think will be important for you. And that, that's why we prepare having this dialogue is important. So we have in, the, in UNCLOS the possibility of working together and uh, cooperating Within uh, by using the, the, the framework of the Inter Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. When we go beyond jurisdictions, so you, you know that the, the International Seabed Authority has the, the, the possibility of uh, countries to work together within that framework. That, so that is the two instruments that uh, you will have. And we know now that uh, we can just go away from the reality. We have a pandemic, COVID 19 has been changing completely and have a large impact. And what we, have, what we have now is that everybody would like to come back to some kind of normalcy. So what is important at this moment, uh, as we are discussing the future of the planet and the role of the ocean, is that uh, all of us, we, we would like to have a fast recovery, but we need to be careful not to fool ourselves and just rush to uh, try to recover at any cost. The other way around, this crisis is a great opportunity for us to start building up 
and really applying what we have already achieved on those policies, those regulations, that understanding that science provides to us today. So we can take a deep breath and think about how we are going to move forward. Yeah, this is extremely important. We don't rush now. This is the moment for reflection. And that's why I again congratulating all of you for having this conversation. So the ocean and, uh, uh, and the ocean sustainable economy will be a critical and instrumental for that recovery. So that, uh, my question to the panelists is what will be your advice to governments and uh, to us, international or uh, intergovernmental uh, uh, UN organization? What will be your advice on how we, uh, what will be the minimum rules for engaging in that recovery and what will be the role of ocean in that recovery? Thank you, and thank you uh, very much to, to the Institute of Marine Affairs for having this conversation and having invited us. Thank you, Dr. Toru. Uh, Professor Gobin, would you start off in responding? Sure, and um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Toru, and I will really appreciate your comments and especially um, reminding us about the role of, um, well, first of all, that, you know, within UNCLOS itself, and of course, um, the role of the IOC. Um, we do recognize that there are already organizations and institutions in place that we can work with, and we certainly will be doing so. Um, I think what, what we need to remind ourselves at the moment is deep sea research and exploration of the deep sea in a scientific environment or in a scientific as a scientific activity is very new to Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, we've had a long history of oil and gas exploration, but we haven't actually been um, showcasing our, um, our biodiversity and so on and all the related um, ecosystems. So, but thank you for that reminder. And um, we, we, it's, a, it's a very loaded question. I think coming out of all of our recommendations, um, there is a way forward and we expect that we will certainly be um, crystallizing some of these options. And I, I, I'm going to lend it over to Alan because he seems to have um, something I'm sure he's going to respond to as well. But thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Dr. Leonardi. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Professor Gorman. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a couple of important things. Uh, one, if you think about it from the U.S. perspective alone, which, which I'm not advocating, some flexibility may be needed since not all are signatories to the law of the sea. Uh, that, that is a complication. Uh, however, you know, the comment I might say to governments worldwide, and, and I think the European Union has done quite a good job with this, particularly with their Horizon 2020 funding, is to ensure that there are resources available to have groups help coordinate and convene conversations amongst the members of the community and the stakeholders. This is what's going to bring us all together on the global context. The European Union has done some of this through what they call coordinate and support actions uh, to bring together not just European nations, but Canadian nations, uh, North American nations in general, and in the last round, uh, South America and African nations as well into the conversation together about how we're gonna attack and address these issues uh, that, that really are common to all of us. And so I, I would encourage many more nations to follow suit as the European Union has, in my opinion, set a strong example. Thank you very much, Dr. Leonardi. And we have a question from a raised hand from Marie Louise Norton Marie. Uh, Ms. Marie Norton Marie, you may go ahead and ask your question. Ms. Norton Marie, you may go ahead and ask your question. Or we will take a question from uh, what was written in our question and answer. Ms. Marie Louise Norton Marie. Okay, she probably did not hear us, um, but she does have a question in the chat. Given the slow development, growth, age, and movement of creatures and plant species in the deep ocean and low potential for restoration when damage occurs, seems that deep ocean impact assessment really should be tied to exploration group. Dr. Amun, any thoughts on that? 
I'm struggling to see that question. Can you repeat the question? I will certainly. Oh, I see it, I see it, I see it. Okay. Um, right. So exactly. Um, absolutely, impact assessment should be tied to any activity that is going to occur within our waters, but also beyond our waters. And that is especially the case in the deep sea, as Marie has pointed out, because of the real potential for long lasting impact. And so here, for instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have an environmental impact assessment um, process, which uh, is pretty much the only management mechanism we have, for instance, in deep waters related to oil and gas exploration and other deep water activities. Um, but it is one that is certainly lacking, um, for instance, just in public consultation and other, you know, central paradigms to that EIA process. So there's a lot that can be really improved in that process for us to be able to ensure that really it's, it's doing the, what it should be doing during that impact assessment process and really ensuring that impacts are mitigated as best as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, did we have a, uh bit of a comment and question from Bobby Lee Dixon. Uh, basically, she's saying that, you know, it's quite a lot that has been presented here today, uh, quite a loaded uh, conversation. Much of it, she says, is foreign to her um, and probably foreign to the average person. Um, and she says what the panelists are all saying is that we need collaboration, particularly for small island development states, and she makes a comment on how important uh, the blue is for economy. Um, and I'm trying to ferret out a question here, um, but bioscience is not really at the forefront of education from a very early stage. Is there something that we should be doing to change our curricula, um, how we treat um, ocean literacy in small island development states? Any thoughts on that? Um, I, can, I can jump in there. Um, thanks for that, um, Bobby Lee. Um, it's, well, I think you suggested that it's not your area, but of course we have been educating um, at different levels, um, of course, at the university, but we've also, um, we at the university itself, we have a program where we go into schools, an outreach program, and we have been communicating. And of course the IMA has a fantastic um, education program and outreach program. So we have been, there's been a fair amount of marine science or marine education programs in Trinidad and Tobago. Admittedly, there's not been um, the same sort of amount um, in terms of deep sea. And um, Diva, as she mentioned in her conversation, she is a director of species. And if you Google um, or if you, you look at them on Facebook, you will find them. And their, their organization um, is um, really attempting to fill that gap. And of course, alongside myself, where we teach deep sea biology at the university, we that's that's the sort of training ground that we have. But I hear you, um, and we need to get the work harder at getting the education out. Thank you for that. We'll take Dr. Netburn and then we'll go to Dr. Ammon. Dr. Netburn. Thank you. So I, you know, I can't speak as specifically to, to small island developing nations, but um, you know, Noah, well, I'll take a step back. Deep sea exploration used to be a couple of people went into a submarine and they disappeared and they came back to the ship and told some stories. And you nobody else could see what they saw. Nobody else could experience what they experienced. You know, maybe you drop some sensors off the side of the ship and you get some data, but really the the, the majesty, the incredible imagery that we've seen in some of the talks today that are really inspiring to people is an incredible tool for, you know, both formal education and also just that, that informal engaging people in the deep sea space, which is something you just cannot get to. You can't walk to the beach and see that. Um, so, you know, somewhere where, where NOAA has, you know, invested with, with partners, again, um, you know, invested a lot of resources is in telepresence-based exploration and using remotely operated vehicles and live streaming that, that moment of discovery, that feeling of being within that environment has, has really democratized 
deep sea exploration and, and created a way for it to be accessible to, to many people. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work there. There's a lot more that can be done. Um, but I just want to, to talk about that, that opportunity to, to bring that, um, you know, to, to everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Amon. Yeah, so just to add a little bit more to what Judy and, and Amanda have already said, you know, science communication is absolutely a, a crucial part of not just increasing our understanding of these places, but also increasing our value for these places. And, you know, the more science communication, the more specifically ocean um, science communication we can have, especially at a very young age, for instance, through our school curricula, would you know really transform the way we know understand and value our marine ecosystems in Trinidad and Tobago but also you know globally and so I think um, as Judy already mentioned species is working to really try to get coral reefs um, just as one example of marine habitats into the school curricula but of course the deep sea is much further out of sight and out of mind as Amanda just said but through telepresence and this is a quick plug um, you know, if you'd love to see some deep sea exploration currently today and moving on from today for the next couple of weeks, there is um, a deep sea research expedition happening in Kiribati in the Pacific, another small island developing state, which actually is showing its deep sea exploration live. I highly recommend you to join and listen to the scientists, join in the deep sea exploration, see the discoveries being made in real time and really be part of that exploration. The ship is called RV Falcor, and I highly recommend everyone to take a look at it later on today. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Amon. And I'll just take one more question. Uh, so he, Hosan, uh, Hosain, he's basically expressing some fear that, you know, you we may exploit our blue economy, develop novel products. But again, similar to what I believe Dr. Banju was indicating, uh, you take it to market, but who benefits? Will the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago really benefit? And then he also asked, uh, nothing was said on, on, on fisheries and mariculture, uh, but those were not uh, the, the main topics, uh, the focus of our discussion today. So here, but any uh, contributions with regard to ensuring that the ordinary man in the street, Trinidad and Tobago, ordinary person, ordinary Caribbean man, uh, find a way to access, be a part of, benefit, if we are successful in, in researching what lies in our deep ocean and monetizing some of that, actually bringing it to market. Any ideas? Marcel, did you want to tackle that bit? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button. Um, but one of the things that, that I mentioned in my, my presentation is really that idea of uh, making sure that everybody, all stakeholders are involved in the development of any research program. And that, that's really important. And, and, and as Alan has said, that's what the European uh, Union is doing with their research programs as well, making sure that stakeholders are involved in not just the outcomes, but also the development of the research program. And, by doing that, by addressing those local needs uh, more carefully, uh, you will get outcomes that are more inclusive for everyone and will benefit the local economy so that everybody gets a boost rather than just uh, the very wealthy at the very top. Um, whether that works is another question, but those are the kind of principles on which we can, we can try and build. Thank you, Professor. I now recognize Dr. Sorry, Ahmed uh, Khan. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Alicia, if I could just add quickly um, in sure, response certainly. to the in response to the question also that um, um, Mr. Hussain, you would recognize that um, the conversation today was um, a lot about, I mean, we had a lot to talk about and we concentrated on the deep sea environment. And I did briefly mention um, about the fishery, um, in the deep sea fishery in this, in this context, but there was certainly, um, we recognize there's huge, um, continuity and huge relationships between the inshore communities, the offshore and of course the deep communities. But as you, um, we, we, weren't cons we weren't specifically looking at the fishery in, the, in this particular um, conversation. Um, the deep sea fishery is not very well known, um, but I did have some information which came to me um, after, literally after I had done my presentation. 
Um, but the fisheries division has got information on the deep sea fishery, which is a reasonably small fishery. And of course, um, but we need to remember that, as I mentioned, these are long lived species. It takes a long time. We're not really at the point where we can really think about developing a deep sea fishery at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gobin. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Khan. Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Ms. Carter Fisher. Um, for giving me the floor. And just by way of introduction, I am a retired marine scientist um, and also retired fairly recently as the director of the Institute of Marine Affairs. Um, I hope everyone's hearing me correct, clear, clearly. Um, so I'd like to first of all um, say that having been given the floor, I'd like to make a few comments, pose a few questions and make a couple of suggestions, if that's all right. So I'd like to start by oh. congratulating the, sorry, go ahead, Ms. Carter Fisher. Go ahead, sir, go ahead. Thank you. You have yeah. the floor. I'd like to start, thank you. I'd like to start by congratulating the, the chairman and his board of governors of the IMA and of course the IC department for this excellent initiative. Um, and as the chairman correctly pointed out, this initiative actually segues very well into the IMA's five-year strategic plan. Um, and of course, I'd like to extend um, my thanks to Republic Bank for the sponsorship of this initiative, which as Ms. Carter Fisher would tell you, uh, Republic Bank has been very gracious over the last three years. Um, so in terms of a comment and question, I'd like to start with um, Professor Judy. Um, Judy and I, uh, as we call ourselves alumni of the Institute of Marine Affairs, we uh, survived the 80s as young research scientists. And um, I was very heartened to hear um, her presentation and all of the mm -hmm. opportunities that she had um, identified for Trinidad and Tobago and the IMA moving forward. Um, what I'd like to ask Professor Judy about is um, bearing in mind our need for a lot of collaboration and given where you sit as the chair of marine sciences at the University of uh, the West Indies, um, do you see um, the collaborations of the IMA with other institutions um, resident in the Caribbean, like the universities of Belize, the universities of Suriname, um, UWI, uh, Sirmese in Barbados, and of course, um, the Discovery Bay Marine Sciences Laboratory in Jamaica, as future activities of the IMA should start um, cultivating. And um, secondly, um, I also heard when you made your presentation that you suggested that the CC process could be used for encouraging investors in our offshore space, primarily those who come to exploit our oil and gas resources to put back a percentage of investment into scientific research. And also to highlight to you that there is also another fund that's available to what's called the Green Fund which at the last estimate had about 4 billion TT dollars in it. That is untapped. Um, the second comment and question goes to, of course, um, Dr. Diva. And uh, just to let Dr. Diva know that um, what you're doing now brings back a lot of nostalgia, for somebody like me, um, because in the early days at the IMA, I had the privilege of working alongside people like Dr. Sylvia Earl, to explore the Cayman Trench, Dr. Snap and Butler at the Bermuda Biological Station to look at the deep blue of Bermuda and um, to look at how we can show some practices ships of opportunity like the RV Malcolm Baldrige, uh, which actually was a naval vessel at that time. Um, so Dr. Khan, your, your audio seems to have to have faded. It, it's, its clarity is it's gone. We are barely hearing you. But perhaps um, we could begin to respond if that's okay with you, Alicia. Yes, please. We're, we're yes, kind of please. Time. Thank you very yes, much please. for that, um, Ahmad, and for um, also reminding everyone how old we are, you and I, but that's okay. Um, I, and just to quickly say, absolutely, um, the collaboration, collaboration, I mean, that was went through the thread of thread 
of all of our presentations. Um, absolutely, when we talk about collaboration, we're talking internally, first of all, within Trinidad and Tobago, and of course, the university um, where it sits and with its three campuses, um, that is sort of unsaid. We already have, um, you know, um, relationships with each other, and certainly we already have a relationship with the Institute of Marine Affairs, Fisheries Division, and other institutions. So, and, and you mentioned University of, of course, Trinidad and Tobago and Belize as well. So that in it, that's kind of what I call internal collaboration. Um, but I think um, what we were also reminding ourselves here is that we do need to have global collaboration because we, when we have a lot of the research vessels that come through international waters, as I mentioned, it's very expensive to do deep sea research. So the collaboration that we, um, we, we alluded to was really um, those global and part, those sorts of collaborations. At the same time, um, you also mentioned about funding. Um, sorry, you mentioned when I, when I made the recommendation about the CEC. Yes, I was talking first, though, about the approach in law. So I was talking about how can we revise, review the law, um, uh, you know, have a look at what laws we have in place that we can actually tighten up a bit and really get scientific research to be done um, alongside the investors or the explorers. Because at the moment, we don't. We allow, we, we do this certificate of environmental clearance to allow, um, in you know, developers, oil and gas operators at the moment. Um, we don't actually tie them to doing or working with an organization and getting some scientific research done. So that's what um, I was alluding to there. I also hear you about the Green Fund. Um, the, the thing is we can make different approaches, but I think a collaborative effort to work on a deep sea project Yes, we will certainly think about that, um, the collaborations um, that you've already mentioned. Um, so thank you for that suggestion. We can, we can certainly explore that option. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Leonardi in, uh, mentioned that he would want to uh, contribute a little more on communicating, especially with uh, indigenous populations. And once you finish, Dr. Leonardi, I will take a question from our Facebook community from Mr. David Ramjohn. But Dr. Leonardi, you have the floor. Thank you, Alicia. I, I just would be remiss if we didn't focus on, on the need for communicating in ways that are culturally sensitive uh, and inclusive, especially for indigenous populations and those that might have traditional knowledge that they can contribute to these conversations. Uh, we really need to be inclusive in our approach. Uh, we need to be engaging everybody who is a stakeholder, but we also need to be engaging everybody who has knowledge that can be shared to improve our sustainable management of these resources. Thank you very much. And the question coming in from Dr. Ram, uh, no, sorry, from David Ramjohn is, how can we transfer the scientific knowledge into effective public policies, legislation, et cetera, that properly govern and safeguard the deep sea resources. Any takers for that? Dr. Nedburn, I see your hand is up. Sure, I think um, it's, it's a very good and important question. Um, you know, I think one of the important elements of this is to work with stakeholders, to work with the decision makers, you know, communicate with um, legislators, to communicate with, with anybody who's going to be using those data to, to influence you know, management and, and regulations early on in the process um, and, and ensure that you're actually collecting the data that they need and that you are transmitting and synthesizing those data in ways that are actually useful to them. Um, I'm surprised sometimes at, at the mismatch that, that sometimes happens across those spaces. Um, so, you know, it, it get back, gets back to something we've talked about a lot, which is, you know, communication, but really that regu regular frequent communication um, to, to ensure you're really collecting and providing what, what's needed for those uh, bodies. Thank you very much. We have one other question, and I'll, I'll say that given it's, it's 3.55, it's perhaps our final question. Again, for Mr. Ramjohn, we have huge gaps in our knowledge of deep sea resources, but also of deep sea ecosystem services from resource recycling to primary production and the role of upwelling, et cetera. 
Are there any efforts to address these gaps within the Caribbean research agenda? And I imagine that will have to be a Professor Gobin uh, response. Thank you very much for that, um, David. And yes, that's the question we're also asking. We're, um, we're trying to guide the agenda. So this whole conversation was really the need to guide this agenda. And that's why I make the, the I made the suggestion um, in my one minute sort of wrap up. Um, we want to talk with the stakeholders. We want to um, speak to the decision makers. Um, a lot of what we do is speaking to scientists like ourselves and some education, you know, we speak to students, young scientists, young people and a mixed audience. But often we don't actually get to sit with um, the decision makers to, in, to inform them of what we have done, what we've already got and what we need to do. And as Amanda quite rightly suggested, that's where we get to um, appreciate what is really needed for good informed decision making. So yes, um, this is what this is all about really, a first step in developing our deep sea research agenda basically. Um, unfortunately, Diva had to leave, but she and I, we've been working very hard at um, putting together uh, you know, some research projects, trying to get um, involvement from different levels, different stakeholders. But of course, as I mentioned, funding, funding, um, Torsten dealt with it, finances, how do we finance all of this? Um, and we need to locate that funding and the support for the scientific research. So thank you very much for that question. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you very much, Professor Gobin. A truly robust question and answer session. Uh, that's all we have time for. Um, but before you go, our attendees, um, when we're finished with our presentations, uh, we have closing remarks from our deputy, uh, it's not deputy director, our director acting. Um, there's a poll that's gonna come up at the end. Uh, we also have the song for the ocean, which has been, especially release premiered today in recognition of World Oceans Day. But before you go, don't forget to do that questionnaire. Let us know, give us your feedback, what you thought about uh, today's event. Um, and we move now right into getting our closing remarks from our director acting. And she is none other than Dr. Rahana Juman. She holds the PhD in zoology from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of London. And she has been conducting applied research on coastal ecosystems, especially mangrove forests and seagrass beds in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean region for the past 24 years. She has a number of published research uh, in international peer reviewed journals, and she has led efforts to develop the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Policy Framework for Trinidad and Tobago, and also to implement marine spatial planning. She has participated in both regional and international projects and has been the lead author for the IPBE, IPBES Regional Assessment on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services for the Americas. She has a range of vast experience uh, working with coastal communities and in, on environmental product, um, projects and in developing environmental policies. We take now her closing remarks. Dr. Rahana Juman. Ministers of government, members of the diplomatic corps, permanent secretaries, our distinguished presenter, Professor Judith Gobin, and esteemed panelists, specially invited guests here and across the region, members of the media, good afternoon. We may come to the end of what has been, no doubt, a very informative session, but keeping the dialogue going, we will. These discussions, which began last year with our first distinguished lecture and panel discussion, are designed to bring to decision makers the possibility we hope we have broadened your perspective on the economic opportunity our marine asset hold and encourage you to consider a shift with regards to sustainable management even now. In Trinidad and Tobago, as is the case with our regional neighbors, much of our wealth is generated from our marine spaces. 
what we hope we have successfully highlighted are not only the new and emerging opportunities, but that all interaction with our ocean and marine spaces must be conducted with the health of the ocean at the center. A heartfelt thanks to Professor Judith Gobin of the University of the West Indies and a former employee of the Institute of Marine Affairs for sharing and setting the stage for our deliberations. She has highlighted the vulnerable marine ecosystem that exists in our waters, their multiple potential benefits and value of our deep sea biodiversity. Our regional and international audience have certainly gained an appreciation of our fascinating marine Caribbean marine environment. Many thanks to our panelists who expertise and experience assisted us in understanding the many different layers and intricacies often inherent in starting new ventures and the collaboration needed for success. All of you, Prof. Jasper, Mr. Hassan Ali, Mr. Thiel, Dr. Arman, Dr. Leonardi, and Dr. Nedwin has given us much food for thought and ideas that we can now pursue in taking this endeavor to the next stage. This platform has brought about newfound relationship, and it is hoped that many fruitful discussion and collaboration, not only within Trinidad and Tobago, but in the region, will be born for the benefit of the entire region. The blue economy, if thoughtfully and purposefully harnessed, offers interesting prospect for wealth generation. And in light of the challenges facing small island developing states like ours, opportunities to develop new partnership that can ultimately lead to research and market success in these new and emerging industries are welcome. At the IME, we will continue to do our part in facilitating energized exchanges, stimulating dialogue and collective learning, even as our research may perhaps lead the way to those desired market opportunities. None of this would have been possible without, without our sponsors, the Republic Bank Limited, who dared to share our dream and has partnered with us for two years. As a marine scientific research institution, communication of science and public education is critical. And we are thankful for your patronage in our advocacy and public education endeavors. I would also like to thank members of the media in attendance and for their service. Our information center has conceptualized and spearheaded this initiative, and we thank them for their commitment to taking the work of the IME forward. I would like to recognize Ms. Alicia Carter Fisher, who is our chief information officer for all our hard work. I wish to also thank the information technology department for their support and assistance, ultimately ensuring today's success. To everyone who joined us this afternoon, your presence at this virtual lecture is much appreciated, particularly your dynamic participation and enthusiastic interest. As I conclude, this year begins the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, as declared by the United Nations. One of the objectives for this decade include a healthy, resilient ocean where marine ecosystems are protected so that its provisioning of a food supply sustainably harvested can continue for many years ahead. Oceans, coast, and freshwater ecosystem are crucial for economic growth and food production, but they are also essential to global efforts to mitigate climate change impacts. Coastal community, particularly in small island developing states, are heavily reliant on marine resources for their livelihood and food security, and are often the most vulnerable of society. I place a plug here for the inclusion of our coastal communities, not only in decision making, but in crafting of business models that see them not only as bystander, but active participants in new industry that can cement well for this and future generation. The spread of COVID-19 has disrupted communities and economies worldwide, including those who depend on the ocean for their livelihoods. The value of scientific research is now more evident than ever during this pandemic. This World Ocean Day, the day we are guarded to commemorate, we must advocate for a healthy ocean, creating a new balance embedded in an in-depth understanding of the ocean and our connections to it. So while our talk has centered on economic activity, conservation continues to be uppermost. Happy World Ocean Day. Let us continue to do our part in protecting the health of our marine environment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Juman. 
And as we conclude, what better way to end than on a musical note? And we have a musical treat for you, and I'm going to ask my tech team, our tech team, to get ready that uh, musical interlude called Song for the Ocean. It is a collaboration between science and the arts to raise awareness of the importance of the ocean to us all. And uh, it's apt that it comes right after Dr. Juman's uh, plug for conservation, not just economic development, but conservation being at the core of all we do. And uh, it's gonna, it's, the song highlights the major issues with regard to declining ocean health and what must be done for the sustainability and protection of the planet. The song was composed by Paul Miller and he's known for his work in uh, providing music for the wedding of Prince William to uh, Kate Middleton. And uh, the words were written by an internationally acclaimed poet, Dr. Graham Davies. And believe it or not, amongst our panelists are, are persons with musical interest because we have uh, professors from the University of Aberdeen, uh, Professor Marcel Jaspers and, and, Abby, and Abby Brown, who were part of this whole initiative. I'm told that you know there is a musical bone in Professor Jasper's body, yeah? So it's not all science, it's science and arts together, both sides of the brain working. And so um, if that is ready now, we go out um, on the words of the song for the ocean. And I thank all of you for joining us. And as we leave you, the song for the ocean, good evening.
million ways to heal. I'm going to ask our panelists to stay back so that we can get a photograph of the panelists. And, and ask one of our tech team to screenshot our panelists. If everyone will turn on their, their cameras so that we can take a screenshot of you. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm wondering if we can get a, a photograph of our panelists, and I'm wondering if our tech team can assist us with that. I Doing a screenshot. Yeah, I think unfortunately Diva had to leave. She's got another commitment. Yeah. Yeah. So our tech team, will you will you let me know once you have completed that task of getting a picture of everyone in the panel? Okay. Sure. And great job, guys. I really thank you very much for all that you've done to bring this information to our side and our neck of the woods. I think this is a first in terms of, I don't know, Professor Gobin, um, for this kind of discourse into what's possible beyond well, the traditional I, um, yeah. Yeah. I economy could, if I could just activities. Say, I, if I could just say it was um, really an expert panel and Colleagues, I thank you sincerely, Marcel, Amanda, Alan, Torsten, Khalil, you know, and Diva, of course. Um, I think I think we did a great job. There was just a lot of a lot of diversity, and really, I think we hit the nail on the head. So thank you sincerely. And Marcel, the song was amazing. I've only just heard it. Really, really pleased. Thank you very much. It certainly for that. was. Yeah. Thank and you. Thank you very much, Alicia. It certainly was. Okay, guys. Excellent, John. Get ready to smile. Oh, okay. Or will we say Happy World Oceans Day? <laughs> Happy World Oceans Day. Day. Okay, one more, one more again. Happy World Oceans Day. Oh, no, not as yet. I'll tell you when. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much. Bye bye, everybody. Right. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. So bye, bye, guys. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Okay. All right, everybody. So well, let's off and see. They're all off one at a time. Yeah, one at a time. have some attendees in there. So yeah. yeah. I, I'm ending it now. You're ending the